Thanks very much, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted you can uh, be with us for this uh, important event uh, entitled Tony Benn Lessons for the Present Crises. This event actually comes out of a promise that I made during my deputy leadership campaign, uh, that if I had been elected uh, as deputy leader, um, Labour would launch a Tony Benn School of Political Education. Now, many people since that election asked me to continue with the idea of in some way developing political education, which is too often sadly lacking uh, in our party. So I've been working to do uh, just that. And kind donations have enabled us to host not only special education uh, events, uh, the event today, uh, hosted with the Rise Festival, but also to put together a teaching pack with a PowerPoint presentation and accompanying notes. Now, the political education pack, uh, Tony Benn, Lessons of the Present Crisis, includes a workshop presentation, speaker notes, videos, and suggested further reading. And I'll be launching it today, and links to the political education pack on Tony Benn will be posted in the chat today. And I'll also ensure that it's sent to everyone who registered today. And also, uh, I'll be circulating it to Labour members, trade unionists, and social justice campaigners to use in local meetings across the country. We want to see dozens and dozens of meetings across the country discussing these ideas using this political education pack. And the donations that we have received will help us to support local groups to put on those meetings. This is about empowering people around the country and activists around the country to deliver important political education for our movement, which will empower us to uh, fight the battles which are here and the battles which are on the way. But as well as the teaching pack, I wanted to draw uh, on the experience of some of those who have most closely worked with Tony Benn during his political life. And that's why we're holding today's event. So today's event isn't uh, running through the actual teaching pack. Today's event, if you like, uh, is um, a prelude to that. Today's event is a special event launching uh, the rollout of the political education pack. So we'll be discussing uh, this with some of those people after the first session, because in the first session, I'll be in discussion with Rachel Garnham from the uh, Campaign for Labour Party Democracy on the key ideas of Tony Benn and why we must continue to fight for them in the Labour Party. We'll be discussing with John McDonnell how the principles of Tony Benn's alternative economic strategy offer answers to the crises in the economy, climate and inequality that we face today. And this session will be chaired by Jess Barnard, the fantastic chair of Young Labour, who is herself doing so much to keep the flag of socialism flying in the party. And finally, the third session this afternoon is a discussion with Jeremy Corbyn, Apsana Begum MP, and Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition on the ongoing importance of Tony Benn's anti-war internationalism in securing a world of justice and peace. Now, before I hand over to uh, Rachel Garnham from uh, CLPD, I do just want to touch on our future plans. Tony Benn is just the first of the great figures of our movement that this project will provide political education on. The next one that we hope to do is on Sylvia Pankhurst, a great fighter for women's rights, for socialism, for trade unionism, and against fascism. We hope to do that to mark International Women's Day 2022. Now, all of this has only been possible by the kind donations from activists. Now, I know that times are hard for so many people, but if you can help with any support for this project, then please do make a donation in the link in the chat. The more people who manage to put something in, the more that we can do uh, in this project. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Rachel Garnham from the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy. Thanks, Richard. Um, as Richard said, my name's Rachel Burnham. I'm a, a vice chair of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, um, a former member of Labour's National Executive Committee, uh, a Corbynista and a Benite and a socialist. And uh, we might get 
onto whether we're discussing whether those three things are the same. Um, I think they probably are. Um, I know I speak for many grassroots members um, when I say how delighted I am that Richard, you've put this event on and pulled it together. I remember during your deputy leadership campaign um, when we spoke together on a, a platform as part of that, um, suggesting that this should be uh, taken forward to whether you win or, or not. And I know I wasn't the first one to do that and not the only one. I think everyone thought this was a great idea and um, political education really has never been more important. And I, I really do look forward to today and look forward to more of these in the future. And I'm really excited to be part of this discussion about Tony Benn's ideas, experiences and philosophy and how they're relevant to today's struggle because um, I think there's no doubt that they are relevant in preparing for today's discussion. I re-listened to the audiobook of um, Tony's letters to my grandchildren so I could start thinking about what we, we would be discussing today and where we should focus. And I, I really do highly recommend that, listening to that, because it, you can hear in Tony in his own words explain his ideas and um, it's quite a starter book. You know, if you want to read the works of, of Tony Benn, there's a lot of them and his diaries are, you know, an excellent history of, um, of, of the sort of recent modern history and the labor movement. But um, this book sort of was a whistle stop tour of key ideas and demonstrated really how relevant Tony's approach is to today. So from, from climate change to issues of peace and, and war, economic democracy, and, and the need for practical ideas to campaign around, which uh, shone through. And, and Tony had a great skill in, in making complex ideas sound really simple. And I think that's a, a skill we can all learn from as we sort of try to build our sort of social movements and mass movements. Um, and I, I wanted to start with a couple of reflections on the impact Tony Benn has had on me as a, a political activist, because my own experience of Tony Benn dates back to soon after I joined the Labour Party in, in 1994, when I moved from the countryside to the big city of Sheffield for university and, and finally met someone in the Labour Party and was and they, um, allowed to become a Labour Party member, um, having been determined to get involved after the 1992 election and that horrible defeat. And I, I find it strange to admit now that when I joined the Labour Party, I had no idea of the internecine warfare that I was getting into. Um, I thought it would be, you know, everyone pulling together for the greater good to build a, a democratic socialist uh, society and a democratic socialist world. And, you know, chance would be a fine thing, wouldn't it? Um, so I was straight into the clause for debate. And, and we were lucky in Sheffield, we had Tony just down the road as the MP for Chesterfield and uh, I remember in my very sort of first term at Sheffield um, in the heat of this very obscure clause for debate that I was able to see Tony speak in person and he made the the case for public ownership and and democratic control so so simply so eloquently um, and and for me so obviously the right thing to do that he he certainly had a, a huge impact on me coming into the Labour Party as a new member and, and essentially, um, you know, finding out which what sort of Labour Party I thought could change society and change change the country we lived in. And, and the stories he used to tell were, were very simple, but it, it, they were, um, you know, spoke to people. So he used to talk about how many unemployed people there were and how many homeless people there were. And, you know, he'd make those obvious suggestions about how, you know, why don't we get people building houses so that people have houses to live in. Um, and later, as I got, got more involved in, in running the Labour Club, we would try and get Tony to come and speak as often as, as we could get away with, because Partly could he, he could always draw a crowd, um, but it, more importantly, he set out the principles that were beginning to get drowned out um, in other parts of the Labour Party under Blair's leadership. And he and the Socialist Campaign Group moving, moving on from there really kept those ideas alive and meant that they were alive and well when they were really needed in, in 2015 um, to be put forward, you know, someone who people who could actually put forward an alternative to austerity, which the Labour leadership at that time had failed to do. Um, so from Tony, I, I learned about anti-imperialism and the anti-colonial struggle, both across the globe and closer to home in Ireland. And I learned about what a socialist programme for government should look like. And of course, he was a, a great champion for comprehensive education as well. And following um, his partner, Caroline's lead, and she was a great champion for, for comprehensive education and 
and Melissa Ben obviously continues that work to this day. Um, and, and Tony would always join those dots between uh, public ownership, democratic control and accountability. And those, of, of course, were the dots that were joined in the 2017 and 2019 manifestos and, and dots that are slightly being obscured now and we need to continue to, to make the point. So in contrast, when, when Blair was Labour leader and, and later as Prime Minister talking about what works and harnessing the power of the private sector as he opened the door to the private sector in schools and hospitals and housing and transport through the private finance initiative and, and public private partnerships and arm's length housing companies. Um, you know, Tony and others in the campaign group would make the connection that if, if the motivation for these companies is private profit, then it can't also be for the for the public good. And, and noting that these private companies not being accountable to local or national democratic structures would, would never be able to act in the public interest. And this becomes totally relevant to, to this day because we have now have this um, neo labor 2.0 with the, the Mandelson controlled leaders office, which we can expect a rehashing of these arguments. And we're seeing that already with the retreat from uh, nationalization of energy um, that sort of elevates the private sector to somehow better, although none of the evidence presents in, in that way. So um, I think never have these arguments been more um, relevant. Um, and um, I think, you know, hopefully we're going to have a discussion in the next uh, 50 minutes or so with, with Richard about how we can, um, you know, the impact of Tony both at the time and, and how that's relevant um, to this day. So just to, to get on to the discussion, Richard, um, hopefully you're going to join me for this discussion. Um, you've spoken of the need to improve political education in our movement and you, you're launching the pack as you've um, outlined already really helpfully. Um, why did you start with Tony Benn? Well, I thought Tony Benn was a, a great place to uh, start because he is really the, uh, the major uh, political uh, figure uh, on the Labour left, uh, the major figure on the, the British uh, left uh, between becoming an MP uh, in 1950 um, and um, Jeremy becoming uh, leader of the Labour Party. And the thing about Tony Benn is many political figures uh, do one thing and do it very well. Some people are great speakers. Some people uh, are very active in the trade union movement. Some people are very active in parliament. Some people are very active in wider social movements. Some people are great writers and great thinkers um, and great drafters uh, of legislation. Tony Benn was unusual in that he was all of these things. Uh, and I think there has been, uh, in recent years, um, particularly since um, Tony passed away, an attempt by some to uh, sanitise uh, Tony Benn's politics, to look back at it in a way which robs it of its actual radicalism, uh, and also to, uh, to narrow him down uh, to being a political figure with um, a far more limited scope than it actually had. Uh, and this education pack, you know, it looks at the three major areas uh, of his political thought. You know, it's in three sections. The first one, a radical democracy, and that doesn't just mean uh, a democratic Labour Party, and that's crucially important. It also means democracy in the economy. It means democracy in wider society, democracy in the workplace, uh, improving our parliamentary democracy, which means fundamentally changing it. And the second of the three sections is on a radical economic policy, uh, most clearly defined uh, in Tony's um, alternative economic strategy uh, in the 1970s, where the Labour government had a choice either to go on with the, the neoliberal diktats of the IMF or to pursue uh, an alternative economic strategy. Sadly, uh, the Labour government uh, decided to opt for the IMF uh, recipe uh, and disaster followed, including electorally. Um, and that's something I think that isn't talked about enough. Tony Benn's vision of how the economy should work. You know, he did believe in an economy that worked for the many, not the few, and played a key role in shaping um, a vision of what that would look like. And thirdly, his anti-war internationalism. And the anti-war internationalism is something that people on the left get attacked for 
time and time again, uh, usually by those who've supported uh, disastrous, uh, illegal and unjust wars. And Tony Benn's anti-war internationalism ran through his political life. Now, as people will know, Tony was unusual. Uh, many MPs moved from the left to the right as their uh, political life unfolds. Tony actually went the other uh, way. He became more left-wing as he experienced the, the role of the establishment uh, when he was a, a government minister and saw um, how the establishment worked and how it frustrated the democratic will of the people and of the uh, Labour movement for real transformative change. But even at the start of his time as a member of parliament in the 1950s, he was an internationalist. You know, he was secretary of the movement for colonial freedom, which was later uh, renamed Liberation. Uh, you know, he's one of the people who um, was one of the first uh, members of parliament to speak out against apartheid in South Africa. In fact, he was the first member of parliament to table a motion about apartheid in South Africa. And obviously, uh, many decades later, he became president of the Stop the War Coalition. So the reason I started uh, with Tony Benn, and as I say, our aim is for the next session uh, to be on Sylvia Pankhurst. The reason I started with Tony Benn is because an Iron Bevan was the, uh, the first... Uh, was the kind of predecessor to Tony Benn in terms of being the left figurehead within the Labour Party uh, as a politician, a speaker and a thinker. And then uh, the Bevanites were kind of succeeded uh, after Bevan's death by the Benites eventually. Uh, and Tony Benn actually widened for a modern era the political scope uh, of leftism uh, within the Labour Party and had a real view to the equality struggles, whether it be for gay rights, whether it be uh, against uh, racism. Uh, and that's the reason I chose Tony Benn, really. He said, if people want to understand what's become known uh, as Corbynism, then the best place to start uh, is with Bennism and Tony Benn. It certainly is. It's, uh, there's a, a lot to learn from him. Um, it's hard to know where to start. So within the teaching pack, you've focused on um just some particular areas because really tony spoke about all these areas didn't he you know all areas of political activity tony had something to say on them um so why did you talk why have you focused in the in the teaching pack on the the um key ideas that you have i think they were the the three pillars uh, of benism uh, really as i say a radical democracy uh, inside the Labour Party, but also in the economy, in the workplace and in society and changing Parliament so it's more democratic. The alternative economic strategy and the anti-war internationalism. As I say, many uh, left figures and many politicians restrict themselves to just one of those pillars. The remarkable thing about Tony Benn is that he, um, he pursued all of these important uh, principles uh, with vigour, uh, with clarity uh, and, and with uh, vision. And so I thought... Those are the three most useful areas uh, of Tony Benn's political thought and practice to uh, have uh, an education pack on for people to discuss what this means, how it applies to the current era. Because these things, it's not just a history lesson. Uh, these arguments, uh, these principles, these analyses are useful, vitally, uh, for facing the challenges we face today. You know, history is very important. History is very interesting. But it's... It's most interesting when we can not only take inspiration from it, but learn the lessons of it to fight the battles of the present and of the future. I think these three areas um, are crucially important. In relation to anti-war internationalism, we see a new Cold War developing, um, nuclear proliferation, the world's becoming a more and more uh, dangerous place. So his arguments on anti-war internationalism uh, are vitally important uh, still. In relation to the economy, you see how the billionaires uh, have um, vastly and sickeningly increased their wealth even during the pandemic and people are facing a real squeeze, the rest of people, uh, on the living standards and we need a new vision of the way the economy should work. So Tony's um, writings uh, and speeches on an alternative economic strategy, um, updated for the present day of course, uh, are vital. And when it comes to democracy, I think people can see more clearly than ever why a democratic Labour Party is a fight that it is uh, necessary to, um, to have. You know, we need to fight for a more democratic Labour Party. Um, but also, I think Tony Benn's idea uh, that society 
and our political system isn't as democratic as people are led to believe is one that more and more people uh, are now agreeing with. You know, if people consider how much control they actually have over their own lives and over what happens in their own community, it's far less than some of the self-satisfied people in Westminster uh, would have them uh, believe. And I think to solve the problems that we now face and the problems of the future, a more democratic society uh, is needed. But when, I mean, Tony Benn was always interested in the question of power, getting state power, which is crucially important, but where power lies in society. And he made the point that power doesn't just rest in Parliament. Uh, you know, power, economic power, um, the power of corporations, um, internet power internationally, all of these things concerned uh, Tony Benn. And I do think as a left, we need to raise ourselves to the level of asking fundamental questions about power and how we obtain that power uh, for the working class in all its diversity. So that's really why I've picked those three areas uh, for the education pack for further discussion. And of course, we'll be exploring a lot of those in, in more detail as the day goes on. Um, and um, I, it was interesting to hear you say, you know, he, he became sanitized because I, I remember when, um, you know, my mum paying money to go and see Tony Benn in a theatre and I was going, why, why are you going to see him in the theatre? You can see him for free at all these demos and meetings. You don't have to pay to see him, but he did, he reached that that wider audience, which um, for me was very impressive. So um, I suppose my next sort of question for you is what, what, what for you was the most impressive aspect of, of Tony Benn's political activity? I think his most impressive most impressive aspect of his political activity was the breadth of it. You know, like the support he gave the miners during the 84 to 85 miners' strike, tireless, to the extent he ended up having his face painted on a um, NUM banner, which isn't an honour usually given to people who are still alive. Um, his uh, work against, uh, you know, his anti-war campaigning, ending up as president of the Stop the War Coalition. Now, the Stop the Co War Coalition is much uh, derided by people who support uh, illegal um, and unjust wars. <coughs> and they like, and these Labour grandees like people to forget that Tony Benn was president of the Stop the War Coalition because the fact that he was president of the Stop the War Coalition shows um, how highly he rated the Stop the War Coalition as an important organisation mobilising people uh, against uh, international uh, injustice and against uh, war. But uh, as I say, for me, the most impressive thing about Tony Benn was the breadth of his political uh, activity uh, and the depth of it as well. Uh, it was well thought out. Uh, slogans are important, of course, in politics to mobilise people, but he didn't just uh, deal uh, in slogans. Um, you know, his writings show that, um, you know, his book, uh, Arguments for Socialism, his book, Arguments for uh, Democracy, uh, his collected speeches, all of these things show that behind his very memorable speeches and phrases was a huge amount of thought, a huge amount of policy development, a huge amount of intellectual legwork. And as a left, that's what we have to do if we're serious, as we are, about having a left-led Labour government. You know, that's what we want, um, but we can't be with e in even touching distance of getting that uh, unless we have uh, a comparable breadth of activity and depth of intellectual, political and economic thought uh, that Tony Benn had. So in that sense, I think um, an evening reading some books by Tony Benn is an even better evening uh, than scrolling, scrolling, scrolling down Twitter. I'm guilty of that sometimes. Uh, I think we could all benefit from uh, doing a bit more reading of Tony Benn's books and a bit less uh, scrolling of Twitter. So, Well, I, I'd like to put in a plug for his audio books, actually, because then you get to hear it in his own voice and you can hang up. As long as you're not scrolling time. on Twitter at the same time. As no, 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 you're is, doing all you know. the useful, boring stuff that you have to do around the house. Um, so... Um, I, I do want to explore some of these details in more, um, you know, some of these issues in more detail, because I think, um, you know, we're both big fans and have, have, have read some of his stuff. And I think it'd be useful for people who are watching to, you know, think about, um, you know, what, what were some of these ideas that, that have relevance? So um, one of the things, I, one of the 
um, examples I was I was listening to or reading this week was where um, Tony Benn quoted Keir Hardy, you know, another giant of our, our movement, when he said we've achieved political democracy, but not industrial democracy. And you, you mentioned it earlier, you know, democracy goes well beyond Westminster. It, it's in the workplace. It's in um, all our institutions. And I, I just wondered what you thought he, he meant by that and what what ideas um, are relevant to, to now, because I think some of these ideas around um, workplace democracy, industrial democracy, um, democracy going beyond Westminster, and of course, you know, Westminster is only one. We've got local government and parliaments in Scotland and Wales as well. Um, yeah, what what do you think he he meant by um, industrial democracy and, and workplace democracy, and, and what what do we need to do to um, make the case for that? Well, that's a crucially important question, and actually, on the subject of Keir Hardy, uh, I think that um, uh, Caroline Ben's biography of Keir Hardy is very. Uh, much worth uh, finding and digging out and reading because you get to really understand the politics of the founder of our Labour Party uh, through that. And through that, you see that actually the politics of Tony Benn, the politics of Jeremy are actually entirely in keeping with the politics of the person who founded our Labour Party. There's always this project from the right to say, look, no, uh, somehow the politics of Tony Benn, the politics of Jeremy, the politics of Diane, somehow alien to the Labour Party and the British Labour movement. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. And I think that Caroline Benn's um, biography of Keir Hardy uh, illustrates that very well. Well, look, you asked the question about uh, democracy. And of course, those who run society want to reduce people's democratic participation to as little as possible. People shouldn't forget that they didn't want women to have the vote in the first place. They didn't want working class men or women to have the vote uh, in the first place. And once they got the vote, then the project becomes how to ensure that people's political participation is limited to, at most, voting in an election every few years. Now, of course, democracy has got to be about far more than putting a cross in a box uh, every uh, few um, years. And at the same time, um, the ruling class deals with the problem for them of universal suffrage by demoralizing people. You know, low voter turnouts are good for those who run society. You know, they want people to be uh, demoralized to think that the political process can't make any difference because if um, fewer, uh, fewer people from our uh, working class majority in our society take part, then that's good news for uh, the 1% and those in the establishment who want to keep the status quo. But in relation to the point about democracy, you know, Tony Benn famously asked five questions. The five questions that we should ask for those in positions of political, social and economic power. One, what power have you got? Two, where did you get it from? Three, in whose interest do you use it? Four, to whom are you accountable? Five, how do we get rid of you? Now, obviously, when people hear those questions, people primarily think of MPs and of prime ministers. But these questions were questions that Tony Benn thought also should be asked to unelected heads of states, heads of international corporations. I mean, these are questions that could be asked to, um, to uh, Jeff uh, Bezos, aren't they? These are questions that could be uh, asked to Rupert Murdoch. These are questions that could be asked to people who run our media. The media, the people who run our media have enormous power, enormous power to push through what I would call weapons of mass distraction, uh, to push through uh, the scapegoating that divides the working class in all its diversity, the power to demonize people on the side uh, of ordinary people. So where did they get the power from and how do we get rid of them? So these questions can be asked to bosses of businesses, to uh, media moguls, um, and to uh, prime ministers uh, and to politicians uh, as well. And we need to, I think, if we're going to push for a truly democratic society, learn from Tony Benn's breadth of vision about what democracy actually meant, because we are on a journey towards a democratic society. That journey uh, is incomplete. Um, and I think that's something we need to reflect upon because I think, uh, you know, if society uh, survives climate catastrophe, if we 
manage to avert climate catastrophe and move on, hopefully to build a better world and a better society. I think we will look back at the form of democracy we have now and think, is that all they had? Did they think that was democratic? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And it, it, it couldn't be more relevant, your, your comments about the media, to the sort of current um, situation with the, the Christmas parties, could it? And the, um, you know, what, why are they coming out now? Why, why has Boris Johnson suddenly gone from this uh, lead in the uh, polls to, to being so discredited? You know, where is that? Where is the democratic power in our society? Um, in an, one of his, um, you know, in some of his writings, Tony Benn talks about how unity amongst the, the poor, which, you know, we now sort, sort of think of 99% would pose such a grave threat to the rich. And, and he said, the rich knows it. So people are, are encouraged to think of themselves in specific groupings. So he, he really does talk about dividing the working class, essentially. And, and he points out that, that the most important division is between the exploited and the exploiters and um, uh, he famously sort of did understand the limits of parliamentary democracy by you know his his words where he left parliament to spend more time doing politics um, and and put enormous value on social movements so in terms of those those social movements and how we bring them to bear in in a society where you know we don't have as much power as we should as sort of ordinary people. How, do, how can we learn from, from what Tony Benn said and did um, in terms of sort of bringing together political movements with, with social movements? And what do you think the role of the, the Labour left can be within that? And what would Tony, what would Tony I think that's you know, a, a vital issue. I was asked the other week at a meeting, could I say in one sentence where the left should be or where socialists should be? Um, and I answered it off the top of my head, but I think it works. Um, I said the place for socialists is in every single struggle, in Parliament, in the workplace, on the picket line, on the protest and in the social movements. And that's what Tony Benn uh, did. And that's what we should do as well, because we shouldn't forget that it's not that long ago that a left-led Labour Party was attempting to take state power in one of the biggest economies in the world uh, with a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council uh, with all the weight that brings in relation to uh, international uh, affairs uh, and um, uh, you know, the, um, the campaign for peace and justice uh, around the world. And so after the awful defeat that we had in 2019, I'd counsel people against on the left saying, that's it, that shows that uh, there's no point in being involved in electoral politics because uh, the establishment's too powerful. I'm going to just do social movement work. I'd also counsel the left uh, against saying, do you know what, I'm only gonna focus on getting uh, leftists elected to parliament now, social movement work, that can't change things really. And I'd also counsel people against only being involved in trade union struggles. I counsel people against not being involved in trade union struggles as well. The point is that all of these aspects are vitally important. And the role of the Labour left, in my opinion, is to bring all these things together, to support trade unionists in struggle, to support the social movements against racism, against sexism, against transphobia, for women's rights, against war. Um, and that's what Tony Benn uh, would be doing uh, if you're alive uh, today. Uh, as you said earlier, it's about joining those dots, isn't it, uh, really? And so, the, you know, socialists should be involved in every single struggle for a better uh, and more fair uh, world. Um, parliament is crucially uh, important, but the social movements and our trade union struggles are crucially uh, important too. But if as a left, we only focus on one of those arenas, then I think that we're, um, we're falling short of the task necessary to really win the fundamental battles in our society, which of course are against the odds given how powerful the establishment are, but history shows it can win those battles. They do. Um, what, what were, uh, you, you mentioned the sort of parliamentary reform, but so I wondered if you could say a bit more about 
Tony's views on the on the system of, of government and the, the British constitution, because he did talk about that um, um, a lot, and, and he clearly wasn't a big fan of the House of Lords. Um, and, you know, why do, why do you think he, Tony, so often prioritised discussing the nature of our democracy? And, and how do you think he would, what sort of reforms do you think he would be calling for today that we should be calling for? Well, well people can actually uh, look at the uh, reforms he proposed back in the early 90s, because he actually drafted a full bill which set all this out called the uh, Commonwealth uh, of Britain Bill, which sought to democratise uh, Britain. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Jeremy is one of the signatories uh, to it, actually, um, which, uh, you know, will be no surprise uh, to uh, people. Um, but amongst other things, it codified uh, a constitution with a charter of rights. And those rights uh, included social rights, economic rights, political rights, including but not limited to free healthcare, free uh, decent housing, free transport, free childcare, a healthy and sustainable environment, culture uh, and leisure time. But what the bill did structurally uh, was proposed um, real reforms to our current um, parliamentary system. Uh, for example, it abolished the House of Lords uh, and sought to replace it with the House of the People. Now the House of the People um, in Tony Benn's uh, bill uh, would have been a, a gender-balanced House of the People and it had been elected, the House of the People, via a proportional representation system. Uh, the bill proposed that the British head of state uh, would uh, become a president and that president would be voted on by the House of Commons and by the new House of the People. Also, the bill uh, proposed... Um, uh, bringing the age of voting to uh, 16. Uh, interestingly, also proposed a truly federal Britain with national parliaments for England, for Scotland and for Wales. Ireland, of course, given the freedom to pursue uh, a separate future. But it's key to understand that Tony Benn's proposals for those national parliaments uh, aren't the same as the devolution uh, we've seen. Uh, he actually proposed that these national parliaments would have far more power far more decision-making power over all matters, um, apart from uh, the Commonwealth economy, defence uh, and foreign affairs. Um, and so it's really well worth uh, reading. Uh, people can get a hold of that uh, book uh, secondhand. It's still doing, um, doing the rounds. You can, you can buy a copy of the full bill with his explanatory notes. Um, and it's really worth having a, a read. But I'm sure that if Tony Benn were around now, he'd have come up with new ideas, new analyses, uh, for his vision of a more democratic structure uh, in our country, because all of these things uh, are works in progress, aren't they? Our own ideas are works in progress, just as our own democracy is in a work in progress. And if we think that what we have now is the, the end point of the journey towards a more democratic society, then that just isn't good enough, is it? It's been a struggle to get universal suffrage, uh, but there are further struggles ahead to ensure that the majority in our society, that every citizen in our society is able to uh, have more power, more power in the political world, more power uh, in their working life, uh, and more power uh, in um, the way our economy uh, is run as well. Absolutely. And I think actually, rather than, you know, just wanting to continue to go forward, we have to stop ourselves going backwards as well. I think particularly in the arena of... Um, you know, local democracy, um, the the way that our schools have been academised, that, you know, local councils become just outsourcing um, departments, you know, for private profit rather than genuinely locally run services with local accountability and, and councillors responsible to their local communities. It's always something um, Tony had a lot lot to say about. and uh, But I think it is, is really relevant that you sort of talk about... Um, Tony's positive proposals for going forward because it's not good enough, is it, for the for the left to define itself by what it's against? It actually has to have um, examples of how it would um, run society in practice, and I think that's one of the the great things that we've got out of the the 2017 and 2019 manifestos is you know there are there are alternative ways forward, um, and and that really was one of the um, great things about Jeremy's leadership was that it, it um, actually provided an alternative that we haven't had since 
um, you know, Ben is at its height in the 1980s and, and really since um, the, the IMF. So um, I did want to um, talk a little bit about, you know, the, the um, connections between um, the ideas of, of Tony Benn and what we now know as, as Corbynism. And I said at the beginning, you know, I'm a Benite, I'm a Corbynista. What, what does that mean? And are they different? And does it matter, I suppose? Well, um, Tony Benn uh, had a huge amount of respect uh, for Jeremy. And I'm only sad that uh, Tony didn't live to see Jeremy become leader of the Labour Party because Tony Benn always believed that you could get um, a real leftist as leader of the Labour Party, a real leftist pursuing all three of these pillars uh, of Bennism. You know, as we've said, a radical democracy, an alternative economic strategy, and anti-war internationalism. Jeremy's politics were defined uh, by those three aspects. And, you know, Tony Benn was hugely disillusioned with many Labour leaderships during his long time as an MP uh, and a Labour activist. But his argument, which he always made, of staying in and fighting was proven correct when Jeremy became leader uh, of the Labour Party. Uh, and it's a real shame that we didn't have uh, Tony's counsel, Tony's advice and Tony's input when... Uh, Jeremy was leader. I'm sure that would have been um, an additional help to us uh, in those uh, embattled uh, times. Uh, but in terms of what are our politics, you know, Jeremy said himself, you know, he doesn't believe in Corbynism, you know, he believes in uh, socialism. Uh, and if people want to know uh, what the Labour left is, then I think the best place to start is with the writings of Tony Benn, and I hope is with this education package that, as I say, everyone uh, on this call will get a copy of. We'll email it out to thousands of Labour uh, members and trade unionists as well to empower them to set up discussions in their own communities, in their own branches, unpacking all of this, discussing it, um, working to understand it, and then working to apply it to the current challenges uh, that we uh, face. You know, leaders uh, come and go, MPs come and go, trade union leaders come and go, but what remains, what's eternal is ideas uh, and principles. And I think that uh, Tony's writings uh, and his speeches as published really make permanent some of those ideas, that analysis and that framework, because we need a framework, don't we? to understand society and understand the struggles. I mean, Tony Benn once said, you end up fighting the same battles again and again and again. Uh, and that's true, and they come in different forms. And so to have an ideological framework, to have a framework of principles and values to guide us through that is essential as we move into what is one of the most dangerous periods in human history, the real danger of escalating global conflict, the real danger of climate catastrophe, the real danger of refugee crises uh, of, on a scale of which we've never seen before due to climate change and conflict over um, resources that become more scarce. So now more than ever, uh, a framework uh, is uh, important. Um, and that's why I think Tony Benn is and his thoughts are a great place to start, uh, a great place to start. Yeah, I, it reminded me of um, another sort of something I read in, in preparation, which was we have the famous questions of where do you get your power and how do we get rid of you? But um, I also found an, another set of, of questions that, um, that I thought were a useful framework, which was who, who gave one person the right to do harm to another? Um, and, and then he sort of answered these very simple questions which is what is going on why is it going on and what can you do about it and that was his framework and I think those are, are really important questions that, that we can ask um you know in, in every aspect of, of what we do as political activists um and I I've, I'm looking forward to the conversations that will come out of um the teaching path I just as I say I was talking to people this week about um their recollections of, of Tony Benn sort of to to think about the, the conversation and um, those parallels with um, Jeremy's leadership and what, what we're now building um, really came out. So, 
you know, one of the memories was that Tony's approach in Parliament was much like Jeremy. He would spend as much talking to much time talking to the um, the catering staff and the security staff and listening to them and their views um, as the, the um, they recall that that Jeremy does and and you know treating people as equals and as people with valid views rather than this sort of hierarchy of you know only MPs have the way forward um, I think is something we all need to I, I agree I mean a point to make as well about the importance of a of a framework with which we uh, approach things and the importance of political education is it guards against the danger of disorientation and we can see that, especially at times of crisis, uh, we're dealing with uh, establishment experts who are very good at disorientating people, very good at pushing the movement down the wrong path, very good at pushing individuals, including prominent individuals, down the wrong path. And if we approach each issue that comes to us or each crisis that comes to us um, as if we knew nothing before that happened and we're just treating that in isolation in the bubble, then we're far more likely to become uh, disorientated. And I think that if our, I, I mean, I believe in the left being self-critical, so I'm very critical uh, of myself, you know, and I think that the left always has to take responsibility for our errors and learn where we can do better uh, in future. I mean, I do think if the, as a left movement, if we reflect upon recent years, I think we can reflect that, uh, you know, the left has on occasions, or, or sections of the left, or people who define themselves on the left have been duped and disorientated, you know, uh, and I'm sure people will learn the lessons of that. But the best way to ensure that these things don't happen again or are less likely to happen is to build in political education and discussion so we can try out our ideas with each other, discuss these things, test our own ideas, you know, reflect upon our own perspectives. So we're going to take some of the questions that have come in from um, people who are watching. Thanks for all these. There, God, you could fill another couple of hours with these. Um, so let's um, pick out some. Um, the first one is, and um, I'll put a few together. What what would Tony Benn make of Labour's current leadership? And particularly, you know, we're facing the biggest onslaught on party democracy. Um, in a generation for in living memory really um, so if we could talk about um, obviously a subject close to my heart you know uh, Ben's approach to to party democracy and can you tell us Tony's view on mandatory reselection or call it open selection now I would say yeah well, that's that's a really uh, important question I think looking at the current Labour Party leadership uh, and the politics it's been pushing uh, in the last uh, couple of years, I don't think Tony Benn would have been that surprised. And this is where I have a different view to some other uh, dear friends and comrades. I don't see this period in Labour's history, the last two years, as some kind of unprecedented departure from the Labour Party's role in politics uh, and in society. It's not been the case that the Labour Party uh, was the kind of left-led party, it was uh, member-focused, uh, with social solutions as it wasn't a gem if the entirety of its history, you know, far from it. So I think that given his historical perspective, Tony would have been able to endure uh, the um, disappointments uh, and work against them uh, in the current period. I certainly don't think he'd have given up and walked away because he thought so much about how the power of the establishment works within the Labour Party, within the economy, within Parliament and within and within society, I think it also reflects upon the fact that if Tony Benn, who later became lead, um, president of the Stop the War Coalition, could stay within the Labour Party, even after Tony Blair had backed George Bush's illegal and unjust war in Iraq, and I'm sure he'd have stayed in it now. I mean, if people's argument was, you should leave the Labour Party uh, and not see it as, as being any use to progressives or the working class uh, because it's betrayed people, then on that basis, every single person would have left after the Iraq war. Jeremy would have never become leader, would have never become in touching distance of power in 2017. And I don't know what uh, we'd uh, be doing. So I'm sure that if Tony Benn were alive now, he would be uh, talking to the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, giving his advice. He'd still be uh, active. He would be critical uh, of uh, some of the policy positions 
uh, of uh, the current leadership, but also have that historic perspective. Because one of the things that's most telling about Tony Benn was his ability not just to live in the political moment, but to reflect upon how we got here and also see where things could go. As you say, what can we uh, do about it? Um, and so in relation to your question about um, party democracy, Tony Benn you know, was a, an advocate uh, of mandatory selection. Uh, he was an advocate uh, of party democracy. But the reason for this, and I think this is really important to discuss, wasn't just because he believed in democracy as a principle, and he did. The reason, and you'll know this better than I, Rachel, as a, a leading light in the CLPD, the real reason uh, for Tony Benn's uh, interest or the driving reason was interest in party democracy and the driving uh, reason behind the formation of the campaign for Labour Party democracy in the 70s was when Labour governments in the 1970s departed from the necessary democratically decided upon transformative policies of the Labour Party. And so people then thought to themselves, well, this can't be right. We've got the policies and we've decided upon them as a movement, the policies that are necessary for a Labour government to implement to defend and advance living standards. But when they got into power, they ignored them. That made people think, oh, you know what? It's really important that we assert those democratic principles, that Labour members who live in communities across our country, who live in the real world, decide as part of a mass movement upon our policies and Labour politicians implement those. And so the point of democracy uh, wasn't an abstract one for the CLPD or for Tony Benn. It arose from an actual struggle to get Labour governments in the 70s to implement the transformative socialist policies that were needed. And so I think that's important to understand uh, as, as, as well, so that we don't end up being unfairly portrayed as people fixated on what some people would disparagingly call rule bookery. You know, we believe in democracy in the Labour Party, but there's political power related reasons for that. Thank you. I, I don't know if you can answer this one quickly because I've got a couple more questions I want to fit in before we finish. But um, I, I did want to ask this one because it says the bosses and bankers derailed Harold Wilson. How would Tony deal with the resistance of the capitalist class to a late, uh, led Labour, Labour led government once elected? And I know that isn't a short answer, but um, I do want to. Um, yeah, there's a few more things to cover, so I don't know how you feel. Well, like, he would uh, he would seek to build a mass movement, and that's it. That's one of the important points of having a mass movement. We can't surrender the parliamentary struggle, but at the same time, it's fundamentally important that we support social movements. Tony Benn always saw the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, which he founded in the early 80s, as being the buckle between the left in Parliament and the wider social and trade union uh, movements uh, in society, that we're meant to, as members of the Socialist Campaign Group, give voice in Parliament using our elected positions uh, to those struggles. But if you get a left government, and this is shown in other countries around the world, and it was shown when Jeremy got the leadership as well, you will face enormous es establishment pressures. Now, parliamentarians on their own can't withstand and can't defeat uh, those uh, pressures. What's needed is a mass movement in society supporting that policy platform, supporting that transformational change in society. So I think Tony uh, would have uh, advocated uh, to do what he did throughout his political career, which is to nurture, support and stand shoulder to shoulder with social movements. It's important in the principle in of itself, but it's also important because it's a mass movement that will defend and support a progressive government when the establishment tries to demonise and dismantle that socialist government. And we couldn't have seen that more clearly in the, um, I particularly remember the, you know, the 2016 uh, coup <laughs> against Jeremy and it was the, the movement outside. And I'm, I'm glad you've sort of mentioned the role of the socialist campaign group because um, I find it sort of frustrating sometimes that the activists on the ground are like, what is the campaign group doing? Um, it's like you are fighting the battle in parliament, we are fighting the battles in our communities and we are working together as one movement for, for socialism. So um, 
just before we finish, one of my favourite stories about uh, Tony, uh, Tony Ben is um, when Tony and Jeremy put up the plaque to Emily Wilding Davison in the House of Commons and um, an unofficial plaque, I, I hasten to add, but really representative of their, their understanding of the value of, of, of the women's movement and equality movements. Um, but I think you've got a few more um, anecdotes about Tony Benn, which we would like to have time for if you could. Uh, well, one of the things I remember uh, about Tony Benn, there's a famous quote about how he, he always wanted to remember be remembered as somebody that encouraged uh, others. And he certainly encouraged me. And actually when I was clearing out my house um, a few months ago, I found this card, which I remembered it, but I couldn't find it. And when I was clearing out the house, I found it. Uh, when I was a, a student, he sent me a, a Christmas card, which said, just said, keep on going. And I think um, those are three uh, of the most important words. And what an important phrase, keep on going. Uh, you know, he had no idea that I'd ever uh, end up as an MP. He was just writing to me as an activist that he'd uh, come across. But we all need to keep on going. Tony Benn certainly kept on going throughout his uh, career um, and we in, in his political life. And we all need to keep on going. And for me, whenever I think of Tony Benn, I think of those three words. Whenever I'm facing difficult times, as we do in politics, I think of those uh, three um, words. But, you know, so many people have so many anecdotes uh, about Tony Benn, how he connected with them, how he uh, inspired them. Um, he was always very welcoming. You know, he invited me around to his house when I was a student to uh, interview him and have a, a chat with him. Uh, and he wasn't egotistical. It's very easy uh, to become egotistical, isn't it? Because when, as a public figure, uh, you're given uh, the right of a platform all the time and people ask you what you think, it's very easy to become egotistical. But I think Tony Benn was defined in many ways by asking you questions about you, about your life, about your opinions. And that uh, is really, uh, is really uh, important. At one time when I, uh, the first time I met uh, Tony Benn, I'd had this t-shirt made, not because I was meeting Tony Benn, but I just got this t-shirt printed when I was at sixth form. Uh, and on the front, it had a striking work from the 1926 general strike. And on the back, it had my favorite quote from Tony Benn, which is, socialism is a flame of anger against injustice and a flame of hope that you can build a better world. And I hope that this education pack, this discussion today can be about that flame of hope that we can build a better world. People want you to give up, but as Tony Benn said, keep on going because victories will come, victories will come. You know, the history of our movement is a history of victories after a series of defeats. You know, we've had defeats. If we give up, that's been a waste of time. But, you know, I know that people aren't gonna give up. We're gonna carry on moving forward, trying to put into practice the kind of politics that Tony Benn believed in, the politics of radical democracy, of an alternative, economic strategy and anti-war internationalism. That's what defines us as socialists on the left. It does indeed. And um, I do, I was lucky enough to see Tony Benn speak a lot of, you know, on several occasions. And he, he did always talk about, you know, encouraging people and the role of socialists in encouraging people. And it's really heart, heartening to, to hear that, um, you know, he encouraged you, Richard, and uh, he certainly encouraged me. And, um, I think, um, you know, that's our, our role as well, isn't it? To keep encouraging people. What do, what do you think he would say to us now to encourage us? I think he'd, I think he'd still say, uh, keep on going. And I also think he'd take a lot of inspiration from the huge social movements, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, the anti-war uh, movement, the movements for action on climate change, you know, the movements for climate justice. So there is this kind of world in which people think that because we got smashed at the election two years ago today, which we did because it came a Brexit election, that somehow uh, the left is gone. Uh, there's no hope. Of course, there's hope. Look at these mass movements. We need to be part of these mass movements, but at the same time, still uh, work to find parliamentary expression to these movements with a view to taking state power and governmental power uh, in partnership with these progressive uh, movements as well. So I think that, you know, he would be deeply disappointed about, you know, the way that some of the policy platform 
uh, under Jeremy's leadership has been ditched. But I don't think he'd be defeatist. I think he would be inspired and have hope. And I certainly don't think uh, he'd be uh, giving up. He certainly wouldn't. Um, and uh, thank you, Richard, for the conversation about Tony Benn. I could talk about Tony Benn all, all day. And I think he, he would be inspired um, by what we collectively have, have achieved in supporting Jeremy for so long, by what Jeremy's achieved, and also by the new generation of um, activists that have come into our movement that are actually, you know, in, um, you know, taking the politics of um, uh, socialism, anti-racism, internationalism forward, which which brings us beautifully on to introducing um, the person who's going to take forward at, um, this discussion, who is um, Jess Barnard, who is chair of Young Labour, who is obviously um, Young Labour provided a sort of beacon of, of inspiration for for those of us who've been around a lot longer and remember Young Labour when there was only three of I remember on the 15th of February in 2003, when everyone else was on the streets, we were inside a Young Labour conference and there was about 10 of us who went outside at that conference and sort of joined the masses. And, um, and uh, that was Young Labour in, in 2003. And I think Young Labour is in a much better place now. So I'm very happy to hand over to Jess to, to take forward the next session. Thanks so much, Rachel. It's um, it's really great to be joining you all, and it was a really interesting session. Um, I hope we can do the next one justice. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. My name is Jess. I'm the chair of Young Labour. Um, it is about a year of, of um, our first term in office, or my term in office. Um, so do look out for a report that I'll be publishing um, later this week about the first year. Um, of work that we've been doing in Young Labour and um, we've got another year to come until our next set of elections so there's still lots of work to be done um, but we hope to keep building that hope and that power and movements like we've heard discussed in the session just now. But for now um, I would like to welcome you to this session which will be looking at the economic ideas of Tony Benn and we are joined by John McDonnell MP. Um, Tony Benn, as we've just heard, was involved throughout his whole life in aspects of class struggle. Um, he was a leading parliamentary figure, he was a government minister, but he was also an activist, a thinker and an author. Um, and for many people, he will be remembered as a leading peace activist. Um, for others, for his work demanding a more democratic society and a more democratic Labour Party. But one of the more central areas of his work, which perhaps less known about today, is his leading role in drawing up uh, the economic alternative to what became Thatcherism, or best known as Thatcherism. He was at the heart of debates from the 1970s onwards uh, that identified all the shortcomings in the British capitalist economy as it entered a crisis after the post-war boom. And that crisis that ended with the ideas of Thatcher winning and with the imposition of the neoliberalism that dominates so much of our society today and has done for decades now. Um, and that's such an important opposition. Um, but Tony Benn has argued for a very, very different outcome to that in what became known as the Alternative Economic Strategy or the AES. Um, Benn's economic thinking was based on the need for for public ownership, including of financial corporations, for democratic control of the economy through workers' democracy, through regulations on the market so that it serves the people and not capital, and for full employment, things that will probably be very familiar um, to a lot of people on this call from recent years of Labour Party manifestos. Um, for Tony Benn, with like everything else, the economy was something that should serve the people and not the few. And in one famous quote that I'd just like to read to you on the economy, he said, the nature of the economic system should be a matter for public choice and free market capitalism should not be accepted without any discussion of the rich variety of alternatives. Unlike civil laws, economic laws are imposed on people with all the authority of immutable laws of nature. 
but the economy is created by people, supported by government intervention, regulation, statute and subsidy, and implemented in such a way that it gives substantial wealth and power to a privileged few, while the majority face a life of relentless work, stress, and periodic financial insecurity. And that couldn't be more relevant than it is today, particularly uh, as we see people struggling in the face of a jobs crisis and the climate crisis, and of course the pandemic, um, which is continuing to threaten jobs. Um, that criticism and the solutions that you put forwards and the battles that we have against all of these things, climate change, economic injustice and inequality at home and abroad are all extremely relevant today. And a key guiding principle of Tony Benn was to demand a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth in favour of working people and their families. And that might be um, hopefully a familiar phrase uh, as it has been taken up again in recent times by our guest speaker, who is going to be speaking in a moment, uh, John McDonnell MP. So um, I'd just like to hand over to John, who is going to talk for around about 20 minutes, or if we're lucky, slightly longer, um, about the economic ideas of Tony Benn, his experiences of working with him in various struggles over the years, um, how Benn's ideas influenced the thinking of the 2019 manifesto and the ongoing relevance of Tony Benn's economic ideas in the challenges we face today. Um, I will take some questions at the end, um, but before I do that, yeah, let me hand over to John. Thanks, Jess. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> um, let me just, let's just remind people about um, Tony's experience because I think it's sometimes forgotten about his evolution as a, a politician, as a socialist. Um, Tony Benn spanned such an enormous length of the Labour Party's history and its evolution from that Attlee period through Harold Wilson, James Callaghan, and then into opposition and then the arrival of, of new Labour. Um, so his life really reflects that to a certain extent, but reflects that evolution. Some of his ideas reflect that evolution as well. Um, it's interesting because Tony always used to joke about has he got older, he got he moved further to the left. And I think I think that's true, but you shouldn't underestimate the environment that he worked in because first of all, in terms of that period after the Second World War and the Attlee administration, if we look back on it now. Um, things that were seen as almost centrist and right wing now, uh, then, now we think almost as socialist nirvana, to be honest, the way things have developed. Um, so he was, his early stages of his political activities was based upon the sort of founding principles of the Atlee government, which was about, as we later phrased it, it was about the fundamental redistribution, irreversible shift in wealth and power in favour of working people. And that's what the Atlee government, um, that was its whole approach, that was its whole objective. And that's what enthused people to elect um, Atlee in the face of what was seen then as almost an irresistible political force of Winston Churchill. And there's, it's important to remember that people People are mobilised and vote on the basis of their experiences of life and how they see and the political how they see the political options of improving their very existence, and that's what happened with the ele election of an Atlee government because it was all for it was looked as though at one point there was a coronation for Winston Churchill, you know, a wartime leader, the media backing him throughout. Um, and uh, incredibly well-resourced Conservative Party using techniques, uh, relatively modern techniques for the time to mobilise that their vote. And yet the real world intruded and people looked back on the 1930s and thought never again. They recognised there was wartime solidarity, but there needed to be solidarity and now in peacetime. And that required fundamental change in our political and economic system. And Tony was part of that. Coming back from his military service in the RAF, he was part of that debate. And it founded, I think, in him 
certain basic principles about how we manage our economy, which is around how we democratize our economy in the same way we want to democratize life in general and make sure our society is more democratic. Well, he also wanted to ensure that we democratized our economy so that people had control, not just over what was happening within their community and nation, but in particular had control over their economic lives as well. He did a, 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 sh a short booklet in 1991, um, A Future for Socialism, and he laid this sort of evolution of political thinking within our society out then. Um, and it, he dealt with issues around he dealt with issues around religion, um, economic thought, political thought, and he introduced into it, which some people shy away from now, that actually there's a moral element to all that we do in terms of our political activities. And there's so a moral element to economic thinking. Um, you, you have to be morally outraged at the grotesque inequalities that there are in our society. And that's what motivated him, I think, throughout that early period, this moral outrage that people should not be living in the scale of poverty that they were. They, they shouldn't be exploited in the, in the way that they were at work, working all as God sent for low wages with limited rights or say over what was happening within their workplace itself. And I think that moral outrage transformed itself into quite radical policy making that he supported throughout that Attlee administration, um, which meant founding, yes, the welfare state, but alongside that, and this is one of the issues he raises in this book, The Future of Socialism, alongside the founding of the welfare state was the key commitment of that Attlee government to full employment. Because, forgive me, my camera flicks on and off. Let me just go back to it. Um, because... What full employment does, it takes away the reserve army of labor that is used to well, used so effectively by capital to control and reduce wages. And what Tony emphasized consistently in his speeches, that the founding of the welfare state, the NHS in particular, but education, council house, etc., were fundamental achievements of the Atlee government, but one of the most fundamental achievements as well is the commitment to full employment which then in itself not only could provide work ensure that people were in employment but also could enable us then to undermine this ability of employers to control wages and reduce wages and hold wages down and I thought it's interesting it isn't really referred to much in in some of the later discussions around Tony Benn, but that commitment to full employment translated itself then into a whole range of different aspects of how we manage the economy. And people forget, Tony was a minister in government. You know, he was a po he's one of the last of the left actually to hold senior office in government. Um, Postmaster General, Secretary of State for Industry, Secretary of State for Energy, and what he did is he took these ideas largely framed by the Attlee government around a welfare state, full employment, and then the other aspect of the Attlee government is the commitment to public ownership and the mobilization of the movement, as Richard has said earlier, to achieve these things. So when he became a minister, postmaster general and Secretary of State for Industry, Secretary of State for Energy, he, he tried to translate those ideas into his departments. And he did it by emphasizing the important role that the state would play in managing the economy overall, but in managing the economy, making sure you used every lever you possibly could to pass power and resources into the hands of working people. The other aspect as well, I think, of Tony's work that isn't fully recognized, but it runs as a theme, particularly after he became postmaster general, all the way through his speeches, he makes references to technology, new technology. And he, he was light years ahead of his time, actually. The role of the state in investing in technological research, um, investing in the translation of that research into technological um, improvements and leading edge 
piloting of tech, well, I, I suppose in many instances, leading leading edge instances of creating a, a new world, a new economy based upon technology. And in every government department, this is what I find really interesting about him. He proved to be an incredibly effective administrator. Uh, in, people get bored with me talking about this, but it's great having all these socialist ideas and it's great having the fiery commitment and it's great mobilizing. But actually, if we are going to use the state effectively, you have to be skillful at it. And if you look at Tony's record, he was really skillful in how you address, how you bring all those things together in very concrete reforms, legislation, and that leading to in investment that was needed in all these specific areas. But also what he was really good at is negotiations. Negotiations directly, if you read his diaries, negotiations with partners in government, other ministers, with prime ministers, <laughs> to try and se secure a majority for his positioning. But in addition to that, direct negotiations with employers and whole sectors of the economy as well. And he was ruthless. You know, the, the Tony Benn we know is a, uh, you know, has always been a friendly, very caring, considerate person. He always has been throughout his life. But actually, he was absolutely ruthless in his negotiations with capital, with employers. If he found that there was resistance, he was not averse to the occasional threat, um, whether it was the threat of public ownership or the threat of legislation to curtail a particular company or a particular sector's powers over the economy. And putting all that together um, in office, I, I, I think people need to recognize just how effective he was. And when we go into government, this, is our, this has been our problem for a while on the left, because we've been out of power, but then when in power, the left has been largely excluded from holding office. We've got a lot of ground to catch up on how you use the state effectively to advance our policies, causes, and secure victories. And I urge people to look at, read through some of the histories of um, Tony's work in the departments, um, just how effective he was in managing a department, achieving his objectives, and at the same time, having a role in shaping the political and economic agenda and debate at the time. I just wanted to make that point because I don't think it's fully accepted. We all look back on Tony's oratory as his, his major skill and his absolute commitment as principal commitment that we admire. But I think people need to also look at his ability to get things done, how you practically implement socialism. Um, as I say, it's great having ideas, which is wonderful. It's great having the enthusiasm. But unless you've got that professional ability then to translate that and to overcome hurdles, just on the drafting of legislation, even when he was on the backbenchers in, in opposition, Tony would sat down and wrote legislation issue by issue, <clears throat> and it gave him a way in which he could raise issues in Parliament. And then when set people said, well, that's all well and good, how would you do it? Tony would say, actually, here's a piece of legislation I've just drafted. Let's talk about my bill. It was just brilliant. And it demonstrated to me that actually one of the roles on, that we've got to portray, undertake on the left is that basic skills training about how we manage the state, how we intervene in the economy, how we manage the parliamentary processes, et cetera. I just say that because I think it's near that's neglected. Next point I want to make, the foundations that he laid with others in the development of the economic thinking of the party um, and his involvement both in terms of the party, and remember, he chaired the National Executive for a period. He was uh, active in all the, uh, in terms of all the very party, all those policy development committees, particularly on economic matters, but also then, then holding office, then out of office, developing in the face of the first wave of monetarism, which we now call neoliberalism, um, the, 
developing the alternative economic strategy was fundamental to laying the basis of the debate and discussion of our ideas that, that would then translate itself into the 2017 and 2019 manifestos. Um, let's just go, go back over the history of this. Callaghan, in the latter part of the Callaghan period, um, Labour's in office up until seven, 1979, Callaghan introduces the first wave, actually, of cuts in public expenditure. The first acknowledgement of a, some concept, of, as I say, they called it monetarism, then it eventually developed into what we now know as neoliberalism. And there were all these arguments that one of the speeches that was given, the party's over, we can't keep on spending our way out of crises, etc. That then developed, that, that enabled eventually the, such a disillusionment amongst working people that Thatcher got elected and then let rip full-scale monetarism, neoliberalism, that were based upon the concept of the, the market always knows best, the hidden hand of the market. It was based upon possessive individualism, not collective solidarity, privatization of our, our public services, trickle-down economics where you know the rich could get rich and somehow this would trickle down to benefit everybody else. It was all fallacious, but we had that's dominated for 40 years. What Tony did, he brought people together. That was the good th thing he did, and Richard mentioned this. What Tony would do, he'd bring people together at his house or wherever, and there'd be a range of ideas people, as well as trade unionists, as well as activists in different campaigns. He'd bring them together, and he would just, I suppose in many ways it was picking their brains. He'd force them to discuss and debate. He'd write it up. They'd then have a discussion about what was next. And what that eventually did, it, it brought together, I suppose, a, a, an alternative program to those early stages of neoliberalism called the alternative economic strategy. And it was, it was about how you manage an economy and control it in such a way that you're shifting power into the hands of working class people. And the way that that was envisaged was, first of all, you would ensure that the working people owned a large section of the economy through public ownership that where what was what was in private hands you would secure a strategy in agreement with private companies and they were planning agreements that you'd ensure that the public ownership that we developed in that period was based upon democratic worker control that was it and that as a result of course you had or connected to it, of course you had full trade union rights now that was the package that was put forward but Tony also, in the debates that we're having at that point in time, um, there wasn't a sort of little, little Englander approach. It was always based upon the development of a wider economic um, strategy that was international and global. And that meant an acknowledgement of the role that Britain had played as an empire. Therefore, our relationship certainly to former colonies was critical. But more importantly, it was about the reform of the global institutions uh, like the UN, and then the development of the other economic institutions that eventually took place, developing the World Bank, IMF, etc. So that development, the alternative economic strategy, it held the left together. It provided us with an alternative that people had belief in and credibility. Um, and to a certain extent, as I say, I think it laid the foundation for future political discussion. The tide was the, the political tide was running against the left at that point in time, and and unfortunately, then there was the election of Neil Kinnock, and Kinnock, although he was seen as coming from the Tribune Tribuneite left, um, certainly um, proved that wasn't that wasn't the basis of his principles, and I think um, Tony, like many others, were extremely disappointed about the role that Kinnock played, both in terms of disuniting the party, the, the attacks on the left, and the shedding of most of the um, policies that have been developed from the Attlee government onwards within the Labour Party, which was based upon this shift in wealth and power towards working people. When, um, when Blair got elected, we had the same problem, but in, in a significant scale. So what Tony, I think quite rightfully did, and quite courageously as well did, he maintained that idea of we might not have won the struggle of organisation within the party at the moment, but what we can do is win the battle of ideas. 
So what he, he took on that role of touring around the country, meeting after meeting, involving people in the discussions about where we go from here in terms of our ideas. And a lot of that was about a lot of that was about the economy. And what he tried to do <clears throat> was maintain at least some element of a debate around the alternative economic strategy, but then also to start looking at how that would be developed on for the future. Fundamentally, um, again, uh, in the discussions that we had, it was, it was how do we translate this into practical activity in government? How do you develop a program that is good for campaigning, but is readily implementable? And that's what the 2017 manifesto was all about, really. We, the, the one thing that Tony did is in, he was a man for detail. It wasn't just general ideas. He wanted to see the detail of some of the ideas that we were developing. During the GLC period, when I was on the GLC, Tony was an inspiration. Um, many of the ideas that we developed on the GLC under Ken Livingston and myself and others were the ideas that we took from the alternative economic strategy, but developed them on on a community-led basis. Um, and so if you look at the work that was being undertaken by Robin Murray and Hilary Wainwright at the GLC, it was based upon some of Tony's ideas about how you fundamentally at the local and at the local community level, but also the level of the firm, how do you ensure economic democracy? So if you look at the work of the GLC, and we involved them in many of these discussions, um, around the development of local economic strategies. We did a London industrial strategy, but we also did local industrial strategies. They were very much modeled on the ideas that he developed, as Secretary of State for Industry and Energy. But in addition to that, um, we had a, uh, a drive to develop the ideas of cooperation and workers' control of the firm. Um, I thought my own view is that many of those ideas were so successful and so popular. That's why we got abolished, to be honest, because Thatcher saw us as an alternative that could actually catch the wind at a national level and remove the toys from office. So inevitably, we, we had to be abolished by Thatcher. And that was a, uh, a, to be honest, almost a proto-fascist act of removing the democratic rights of Londoners overall. But those ideas we experimented with, with at that time. And the, the GLC's manifesto was a few hundred pages of detailed policy making. And that suited um, Tony because he was a man for developing detail of policy itself. When we were drafting up the 2017 manifesto, the key elements there were fairly straightforward, really. It was how do we ensure this transfer of power and wealth? How do we ensure that um, it's based upon, first of all, um, workers' rights? And that meant full, uh, we took the Institute of Employment Rights um, program and said that's our Employment Rights Manifesto, restoration of full trade union rights, exactly what Tony had been campaigning for all, all that time, making sure that we had worker democracy. And that meant a third of all boards would have worker representatives. We looked at the transfer of wealth in a company as well with employee ownership schemes on a corporate level, on a collective level, not individual level of share ownership. And then, of course, what we did is we said we'd double the cooperative sector. I actually think we're a bit too timid on that one. I think if Tony had been with us at those final stages, he would have been pushing us up to make it most probably a tripling or quadrupling. But then also what we did, as you know, we, we laid out the foundations of what would be um, the basis of public ownership in a, in a modern world. And in many... Uh, in many of the debates that we had in Parliament while Tony was still alive, it, the rail nationalisation was obviously something he campaigned on so, with the unions. Then in addition to that, we were looking at how we could in, energy. Energy was one that he'd always argued for should be in public hands and water because the privatisation was such a scandal. And then we looked on at new ideas like, like broadband, of course. On, on all of that, the discussions that we had um, when we were in, through opposition, in opposition on the back benches with Tony was an advocacy of a new form of public ownership. And if you look at his writings, it's absolutely explicit what we were about. It was about ensuring that there was a, anything that was in public ownership would be managed by the workers themselves. 
the consumers or passengers, whatever, but also community representation itself. And that's the model that's through, if you look at his writings on all of this, is throughout his writings. And he accepted the criticism of the Atli government form of nationalization. I think he was one of the earliest politicians to do that, um, particularly because of the experience in, 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 the, in the nationalization of the mining sector. So we built that into the into the uh, manifesto itself. One of the issues we never um, developed on is Tony was very keen in some of his writings about capital controls. We never, we never advanced that because at that point in time, we didn't think it, it was necessary and we were living in a slightly different world. But what we did do is take some of his ideas about the approach to the finance sector. And that meant, for example, setting up the National Investment Bank, the bringing the, the Bank of England, maintaining its independence, but having its mandate democratically decided. And in addition to that, to take some controls over the stock market as well about who would be listed on the stock market. And that was in particular about using criteria that um, we developed around one, the environment, two, human rights, and three, uh, treatment of workers themselves. I'll make this final point as well. Um, in his economic discussions, if you look at the, the book that The Future of Socialism, but if you look at some of the other his other writings as well, he re, he reflected quite in, well in advance of his time um, the two main priorities that we had. One was tackling the grotesque inequalities in our society by the redistribution of wealth and power. But actually, if you look at his writings. He was one of the earliest politicians to address the issue about how our economic policies would tackle environmental degradation and climate change. And again, I don't think enough tribute has been paid to him on this. He was one of the first who actually said, if you're going to develop an economy, of course it's about wealth, and it's of course about power, but also it's about the environment. And again, so we developed that on into our into our two manifestos um, as basically one of the central objectives in exactly the same way. The way in which Tony talked about the environment as well is because of this interest in technology that he had, his argument was that we live, we have an economy now that can create abundance, but that creation of abundance will enable us therefore to allow, enable everyone to have a a, a decent quality of life, we can eliminate poverty, we could assist in doing that globally, but that abundance shouldn't be at the cost of our environment. Quite the reverse. His argument was that you could use technology to enhance the environment. Not, not many were even talking of the issue at that point in time. Um, what, always, um, what always really just inspired me is that on the various environmental campaigns that were taking place before he died and move, um, escalating at that point in time. He was always contributing to them and at sometimes at the forefront to some of those campaigns as well. And again, it demonstrated to, to me that how your concept of socialism can evolve over time. And it's the Tony Benn concept of just listening to people, enhancing your own thinking as a result of doing that. And at the same time, in doing that yourself, you're then able to pass on the message that other people have created created for you. And that, that's what inspired me about him. We all have our own personal anecdotes on, on all of this, um, but time after time, the, the, the issue for me is, you know, I'd pick him up, we'd, we'd drive him somewhere or we'd jump on a train or what, whatever. And it didn't matter to him if he turned up at a hall and there was, 500 people or just three people he would just sit down talk it through and people would come out of the room enlightened knowing something they never never knew before they went into that room but they'd be have a confidence about them particularly when he talked about economic issues they have a confidence about them because he demonstrated practically this is our objective this is why it's our objective, step by step, this is how we achieve it. And as a result of that, socialism, which is never a fixed state, it's something to aim for, will advance towards socialism and our socialist practice will be, will be so much improved as a result of the, 
this individual discussion. I always found that, and that's what I admired about him. Final, final point for me, you know, when I was, became Shadow Chancellor, I set up an economic council, um, Joe Stiglitz and all the others. If Tony was still alive, I would have appointed him to it um, because I think he would have been an inspiration to those discussions. Um, I think he would have punctured some balloons at times um, in, in those discussions because he was incredibly pragmatic about how you approach things when the depth of his experience enabled, would enable him to do that. But at the same time, I think he would have enabled us to lay the basis of the detail of the programme and to have him at the end of a telephone when key decisions were about to be made would have been absolutely invaluable. That's why I miss him now. Thanks so much, John. That was an incredible contribution. Um, I'm sure there's rounds of applause across the country. Um, uh, before I take any questions, and if you haven't sent in your questions yet, please do, do send in your questions. We have got time for those in a moment. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple quickly first, though. Um, and just firstly, John, you, you mentioned the the phrase uh, that the party's over, we, you know, we need to cut public spending, something that's been rolled out kind of time and time again, government after government as an excuse to cut public spending um, and put that burden on, on working class people and the poorest people in society. And I think one of the things that we often experience, um, I know you absolutely did uh, over, over the course of um, your time as shadow chancellor um also i guess any any socialist in the public domain is just such incredible hostility uh and scrutiny by uh the media by the establishment um and also i guess by by the public who kind of can't see past the status quo of of, of capitalism so what what would you say to that what 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 would you say would is the best approach to that how do we handle that and how do we get past this to be able to start talking um, about this different type of economics when those phrases were used by callahan and his team you know parties over you can't buy your way to a council uh, out of a crisis and all this stuff tony directly challenged that argument um and all they were simply saying was that we're not willing to redistribute wealth we're not willing to, to use the full mechanisms of the state, whether it's through taxation or whether it's the creation of resource by the state itself, the printing of money. That's what it was all about. And monetarism was all, was all about trying to use an element of economic argument to prevent the redistribution of wealth and power. That's all it was about, because you know, it makes me laugh at times. You know, we're in the COVID crisis, you know, there were, or in the banking crisis, when the resources are needed by capital or by a Tory government, they find it, you know, with, <laughs> what was it now? The figures were about 400 billion we found to bail out the banks in the bank. Before that, you know, we could, anything, anything mentioned before that was outrageous. If you simply ask for a couple of billion to lift people out of poverty or a few billion to build enough council homes. And it's the same as the COVID crisis, really. December 9, 2019, I put forward a programme. In the end, it was about 400, 400 billion to tackle both in terms of the backlog of disrepair to our welfare state, housing in particular, and then also to tackle climate change. And it was over a 10-year programme. I thought it was pretty modest. In fact, we should have much more made it bigger. But... What then happens if we're told it's a magic money tree, you can't, the money doesn't exist, it can't be found, COVID crisis hits, <laughs> they adopt our policy of further, which we put forward, and they find 400 billion virtually overnight. So it, uh, what Tony did is he just punctured that argument from the very beginning about monetarism. But it's true, it took hold. And when you have the Tory party in the whole of the media pumping it out continuously, you can understand how people... Well, basically how it permeates society overall. The tragedy of it was, is it permeated inside the Labour Party as well. So our economic policy making for the next 40 years reflected the hegemony of neoliberal, neoliberal ideas. Tony's arguments against those I thought were fundamental. You know, this is all about uh, one class controlling our society and our economy at the expense of working the working people. Uh, and he, the same as all of us, really, 
he believed in the labor theory of value, that wealth is created by the labor that is put into the raw materials and the operational machinery or whatever, or the intellectual capacity of people. And it's the workers who create the wealth in our society. So all we were asking for is those workers had, a, had the true value of what they created. And of course, the capitalist system doesn't allow for that. That's why all those arguments were mobilized against. And it's only after 40 years of dominance of neoliberalism and 11 years of austerity in particular and the pandemic crisis that people have woken up to the fact that these theories are not, do not reflect what our society, how it operates or how it should operate. I think the, fu the laugh, the, the funniest one is trickle down economics, isn't it? How they got away with that one, you know, you make the super rich richer and somehow, somehow we'll all, it will trickle down to us. So it never, never worked. In fact, it still isn't. And those super rich are getting richer, um, largely on the basis of Tory party policies, because those Tories will eventually be joined that super rich elite if they're not in it already as a reward, basically, for the policies that they're pursuing. Tony exposed all that all the way through. Um, the, the good thing about it, though, now is that as a result of some of the debates that he instigated, we now have fairly extensive detailed policy in every area um, to challenge those, the ideas, but then also to, to lay out the details. So let me give you one example. When we were in, um, Jeremy was leader and I was shadow chancellor, and when it came down, we said, let's look at the industries we want to bring into public ownership. Where is the worst exploitation taking place? One of the areas actually was water. It was appalling that this natural resource gets privatized. And in addition to the vast profits made, the poor service delivered, and also the use of some of the water companies for blatant tax avoidance. So what we did is we took Tony's ideas, we brought the trade unions together, we brought groups together who were interested in public ownership, like we own it and others, and we just sat them down, almost locked the door, work out the proposals on how this is done. And what, what came out of that was report after report in detail about how each issue, issue would be managed. Uh, one of the key issues that came up is that the loss of expertise in that particular sector over years, largely because of low pay and lack of ability to recruit or retain. We looked at how a skills workforce would be developed as a result of that. We made sure the pensions were guaranteed and protected. We made sure that consumer involvement was done in a whole range of different ways. So that's the sort of, we took Tony's ideas, some of the work he'd done in detail, then we translated it and just gave it to the people who would develop that policy. And it worked, it was just inspiration. We did one conference on alternative models of ownership and it was absolutely terrific. Um, actually, even elements of the PLP who were uh, completely opposed to what we were doing admitted that the work we did in that field was concrete and real. And some of them, even some of them became converts to it, which was quite remarkable. So again, a lot of that was, was based upon that sort of foundation that Tony had raised, but also the spirit of what people describe as Benism, which isn't just the art, eloquent articulation of ideas, is about the detailed practical implementation in government and how you use the state effectively. Thanks, John. Um, I had quite a few questions lined up for you, but there's absolutely loads in the chat. So I'm gonna to move to the ones that have been sent in because hopefully we can cover quite a few. Um, so thinking about, you know, you have touched on um, the role of local government, but could you expand a little bit more around how how local government can play a part in this, how Labour councils can kind of lead the way on this? Um, and then also, what would you say the some of the greatest difficulties would be as a minister in implementing socialist policies and particularly thinking about the civil service, financial sector, um, the media, all of the, the layers of opposition that you'll face? How how would that work and how has that changed since Tony Benn's time? On local government, um, we need now um, a radical programme of reform and change. Um, in, in Tony's day, um, local government had an element of autonomy that no longer exists and it had a resource base that no longer exists. Let me explain. When I was on the GRC, I was chair of finance, so I was like the Chancellor's Exchequer for London. 
it, I look back on it now like halcyon days. We had control of the rates, business rates. We could no controls in central government. We had control of business rates. We had control of the preset, the equivalent of the council tax. No central government controls. And I had a relationship with the City of London with a capital fund um, that enabled me to borrow very, very cheaply, um, even with the support of the Tories on the GLC. And all I had to do was secure on capital expenditure um, a, a money bill, a bill through Parliament. Um, on one occasion, only on one occasion did Tory MPs argue that they wouldn't support our capital bill going through Parliament. And on that basis, I used I introduced what I call the policy of positive discrimination, which if you don't vote for our capital bill, you won't get any capital spending in your constituency. Um, that went down. You can imagine how that went down amongst the Tories in, in Parliament. And Ken got called to the bar of the House to be accounted for it and all the rest. But anyway, we got what we wanted. Um, and so there, I, I remind people, when I used to go into the city of London and I'd speak to all these finance people, companies and the banks and whatever I'd all if I was in the city of London I used to say look you don't you know you 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 tell me you don't believe we're capable of, of managing a government etc I said if if it wasn't for me you'd all be swimming at the moment because it was the GRC that was me as chair of finance that finished off the Thames barrier and if it wasn't for the GRC having those resources and local government having those resources literally what half of London would be underwater at the moment. So again, it just demonstrated, one, the resources that we had and the powers that we had and the energy that we had as well in terms of not just elected, what was interesting at the GRC, it wasn't just the elected politicians, but it was a bureaucracy that wanted to do things. And that even though they might not have agreed with us politically on not lots of things, they actually accepted that we were democratically elected and they would do the job to the best of their ability. <laughs> those that didn't we, we got rid of simple as that so what that what we need in local government at the moment is first of all i my own view uh, local government will not be effective unless it has its own independent source of revenue separate from central government that's why i'm quite keen on land value taxation for use by local authorities to give them independent resourcing um, in addition to that the ability to to borrow effectively at cheap rates, et cetera, is fundamental. They do it through the Public Works Board at the moment. There's a debt overhanging on local authorities, and I'm arguing at the moment that the government needs to introduce a policy of writing off a significant amount of that debt in the same way they did with the bad bank debt in the banking crash. In that way, local authorities would have the resources again, but I also think that they need a wider range of powers to enable them to reflect what's happening in the local community. And again, I think in that instance, it would make local authorities so much more interesting to the, the local community. The recognition of the role of the state would, would be there and they'd be able to implement policies in their local area that as led by democratic decisions, their local community, of course, and also I think would transform many of the areas that people um, recognize are in need of investment and resourcing to deliver the public services at that local level. That's the reform I want. Um, how, how do you move on as well? And, and remember, before Tony died, we had the first developments of community wealth building, Matty Brown up in Preston, developing the Preston model. Again, that was an exciting development based upon some of the work that we'd done at the GRC of bringing communities together working with what are described as anchor institutions in the community wealth building model uh, and has been exciting because it's been done under a Tory government with limited resources. So you can see that I think there's those real potential in local government if it gets the resources and powers that, that they need and if they pursue that sort of community politics development that has been, um, I think, very successfully brought about by the work of people like Matthew Brown and others up in Preston and others. So I think there's a real opportunity for local government. I'm worried about um, the democratic processes in local government. I've never been, a, I've never been um, in favour of directly elected mayors. I think it puts too much power in individual hands and develops the cult of sort of personality rather than it does about the collective action of peoples and communities. And it looks as though in the levelling up white paper, 
Michael Gove is bringing forward is that we're going to have elected mayors or governors, as he calls them, for the whole of the country. I think my own view is I think you should keep, keep the title of governor to management of prisons rather than local authorities, to be honest, but there you are. Um, that, that's the issue on, on, um, on local government. In terms of when you go into government, how do you deal with all the opposition um, that you might face, both in terms of civil service, media, etc.? cetera? Um, Richard has said it earlier, um, the best resource that we have for change is the mass, the people. So you have to mobilize a movement. You have to ensure that the people understand what you're about, what your vision of society is, what your policy program is that will achieve that vision. But you include people in the development of those policies and you, you develop movements around every aspect of our work, whether it be a movement supporting our policies on climate change, whether it be a movement support in our development of public ownership on transport or wherever. And in that way, I kept saying before the last two elections, in that way, it's not us as individual politicians or a party going into government. We all go into government. One of the things that we did at County Hall, we just opened up County Hall. We just said, if you've got an idea, you want to come and develop it, we'll book you a room. And every night at County Hall, literally every room would be packed with people discussing their ideas. Some of them are completely balmy, you know, that's it. But that's what you get. Some of them absolutely really creative. Some of them light years ahead of our time. And you think, well, this is this can't be. But then you do, you hear the argument literally every night that was going on. So as we, although we were elected on a manifesto, our policies were nourished by that debate. And that's what we should do in government. We should open up the doors of government, allow people to come forward with their ideas, allow them to resource them to develop them, sometimes in opposition to us if necessary, because sometimes there needs to be a bit of friction around how you develop policies. And in that way, you're building a movement in government rather than just a party in government. I've often found with regard to the civil service that in that way, you can hold the bureaucracy to account as well. If you've got a civil servant who's going to have to go along, for example, to a citizen's assembly and be held accountable for the development and implementation of a particular policy on climate change, for example, I think that that is a salutary way in which you then ensure that bureaucracy reflects the will of the people as much as you possibly can. In terms of the media, my view is we have to reform ownership of the media. If we were in government, we would have a, a strategy that's developed upon ensuring that ownership of the media does not fall into the hands of a number of oligarchs as it is at the moment. And in that way, you democratize the media itself. But in the meantime, to win elections, etc. The point that I made continuously, and I don't think we succeeded on it, is that you have to be professional about how you present your arguments. Yeah, we, we won Jeremy's leadership election because the way in which he toured around the country, talking to large numbers of people, but also because we were light years ahead in the development of social media. And we did that up until 2017, between 2017 and 2019, we lost our leading edge, particularly in the social media, and also the battering, the character assassination of Jeremy in particular, went on day after day after day. And I don't think we effectively countered that in the way we should. So some of the lessons that we've got to learn is how do we regain our le the leading edge role that we had in terms of new forms of media? Then also, how do we make sure we rebut the attacks much more effectively? And then, yes, in many ways, yeah, you challenge them all the time, you know, you challenge them all the time. I used to say to our lot, look, don't shy away from going on the mainstream media, particularly the broadcast media, because if nothing else, if it's a live program, at least you'll get that 30 seconds to a minute live. They'll then doctor and edit it afterwards, but at least you've had that short period of time. And in terms of the media training, Forget all that sort of standard media training of how you don't answer a question. Just go on. We media train people to answer the question. Just go on. This is what we believe in. Actually, quite proud of believing it. And this is how we're going to do it. You might disagree, but let me try and convince you. Move on like that. So I, I think that's the number of the lessons that, that we've got to learn. But we've got to we've got to we've got to lead the debate about having a, a truly democratic media within this country. And removing it from the hands of these oligarchs who who lie who just lie you know that these are the people who've just in december 2019 two years to today 
to the very day itself, supported and enabled possibly the biggest mendacious prime minister in our political history to be elected. Why? Because a liar was supported by liars. That's how it happened. Thanks, John. And it was, you know, thinking back, and it's a painful day to think back, really, but it was so refreshing to see um, politicians and MPs like yourself, like Jeremy, and I guess now, you know, those, those new generations of MPs coming through, going on and just speaking honestly and answering questions and, and not kind of using the same performative uh, media tactics that we'd seen for so long that people really, really don't like and, and distrust. So that was, yeah, it was wonderful to see. Um, before we before we wrap up, I am going to try and squeeze in two two more questions. So just the first one, which uh, fitting ahead of the next um, next session, um, Tony famously argued for money to be diverted away from from war, away from nuclear weapons, um, and to be used. Um, you know, for other things. Um, and also, I guess, with all of the, the international struggles we see going on and the sanctions imposed by uh, the US on countries like Cuba um, and other socialist countries around the world, what is it, what do you think we can do about this moving forward? Um, and is this something we should be fighting for on the left? Tony's view on all of this, um, fairly fundamental, is that we should be a pacific nation. We should be a nation that pursues peace, not war. And if you listen to some of his speeches, every time there was an, another military adventure by Blair or whoever, um, he stood up on a matter of principle. And I'll always remember that speech where he, he quoted the United Nations statement. It was just absolutely moving, but reminded us all of what, what we're about. And if we were in government now, let's be clear, we would be, we would be a government that was about peace, not war, and it would be about... Um, if you remember, we were we were arguing for conflict resolution being the key element of any foreign policy, and that would be our investment of resources. We did win a bit of that argument, interestingly enough, with Gordon Brown, because he did put together a pool of resources for conflict resolution, cross departments, Treasury Minister of Defence, and, and Daffod, and, uh, etc. But then what happened is that the military even started using that then uh, contrary to its original purposes. But that would be the approach forward. Our ambition would always be to get rid of nuclear weapons. So I know we couldn't win the, we couldn't win it to ensure that it went in the, either of our manifestos fully, but it was, a, it was quite clear that, that, that any socialist now, it's the, uh, we have to really be clear that that must be one of our objectives and we need to fight for it within our movement. There was resistance and there was resistance in some trade unions who were linked to work within that field. The arguments around how we have a just transition, just as much as we're arguing for climate change, we should be arguing for militarization as well, a just transition so that the alternative employment is available and that we scrap them once and for all. And the, in Scotland, they're gonna challenge this all the way through as well. And I think that'll be happening elsewhere. So. There's a real, I, there's real potential. I fear, though, I still, I really fear that there's something, you know, there's something in the heart of British politics which is, re, re, retains that gunboat policy or that imperial policy of, where, you know, br bringing peace to people by waging war. I can never, I could never forgive Hillary Benn for that speech he did from the Labour front bench attacking our policies and pursuing peace and attacking Jeremy personally as well. I thought that I'm just, in some ways I was pleased he'll, Tony never lived to see it because I think it I thought was disgraceful. But I'm, those principles that Tony, Tony adhered to because he'd experienced war. You know, it's interesting, all those ones, even Dennis Healy said at one point he wouldn't press the nuclear button because those people have experienced war realized what it was all about and they certainly never glorified in it and they certainly i think my view it lent them towards the role of our country to pursue peace rather than war and that inevitably that inevitably lends itself to scrapping of nuclear weapon final point from me there was a question that came up i've noticed in the chat about land ownership 92 percent of land is privately owned did ben have any ideas now to change this tony believed in the public ownership of land 
Um, and if you look at what we did before the last election, we had a working group under George Monbiot that brought together a whole range of land uh, specialists. We looked at the work, work by Guy Shrubshot about who owned land. Then we looked at the policies that we have pursued to become democratic control of land and ownership with the development of community trust to own land by local communities. So we were going to take that step on uh, to challenge the whole land ownership. And again, it just just demonstrate he was light years ahead of his time, Tony, on some of these ideas. And his argument then was the same as we're arguing now, is that unless you have control of land and the use of that land, you won't be able to produce an agricultural system which will enable us to tackle environmental degradation in particular and climate change as well. Sorry, I'm, Jess, I couldn't let that go. No, I thanks, John. I saw that pop up a couple of times. Um, before I hand over to um, Richard, who is going to introduce the next session, I just want to end on one final question for you, John. Um, could you tell us very briefly your favourite memory of Tony Benn? Um, uh, there are so many, really. I, I, I'll tell you a, a private one, really. One of my favourite things, and this just reflects, I know this sounds terribly bureaucratic, and I am, one of the things that Tony did, he brought together all the left general, trade union general secretaries. And my favorite memory of him is at those meetings where he would get together basically um, general secretary after general secretary, and you'd go into the meeting and there would be a difference of view on a particular issue. I never knew me leaving one of those meetings where consensus wasn't constructed. And that's my memory of him, that style of work. There's lots of individual actions and stuff like that. And lots of jokes we used to have. But it, people need to understand his ability to negotiate and achieve consensus was remarkable. And he did it with a mixture of he did it with a mixture of thoroughness of understanding what we were about, clarity, eloquence in being able to explain an issue. And then sense of humour as well. He's one of the wittiest politicians I've met. Bergen's got a bit of that as well, I have to say. <laughs> well, that, that's uh, nice to hear. I've got a sense of humour. I sometimes get, sometimes get accused of centrist dad jokes, uh, exactly. which is... That, uh, look, anyone who's a heavy metal fan has to have an element of humour in them, I think. That, that's true. That's true. Um, well, thanks so much, John, for that. And thanks also, Jess, for... Uh, chairing that session, which I think was a, a really important uh, discussion of the uh, alternative economic strategy that Tony pioneered in the 70s, and also its uh, lessons uh, for now. And I also think something that was really useful was the reflections upon uh, the job Tony did as a minister, and what lessons we can draw from that in how we attempt to use the state to put into practice uh, our socialist uh, policies. Uh, before we move on to uh, the next uh, session, um, I just want to uh, redirect people to the education pack we've produced. So the, the link uh, is in the chat. We're going to email it to everyone who registered afterwards as well so that they can download it. And I'm going to be emailing it out to uh, tens of thousands of labour and trade union uh, activists because the education pack, which today is launching, uh, is really about empowering you to engage in political education discussion in your own trade union or Labour Party branch, your own campaign group, your own uh, community. So please do download it, have a read of it, and think about how you can organise uh, the session uh, about uh, lessons um, for the present crisis from uh, the politics uh, of Tony Benn. Uh, and as we've said, a bit like today, it's in three sections. Firstly, a radical democracy in the party, uh, in the wider economy, uh, and in the workplace and in wider society. Secondly, the alternative economic uh, strategy. And thirdly, an anti-war uh, internationalism. And that brings me to uh, our next uh, session. And I think we're still waiting for two of the participants to uh, join us. Um, and I'm sure they'll be with us uh, very shortly. Um, but I want to give some introductory remarks before I welcome uh, one of the members of the panel, uh, Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition. Now, as we've said before, Tony Benn was an internationalist throughout his political life. In the aftermath 
uh, of the Second World War. He became the secretary uh, of the Movement for Colonial Freedom. Now that was founded in 1954 and later was renamed Liberation. Tony, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, was the first member of parliament to table a motion against apartheid in South Africa. He argued Britain and the United Nations should completely boycott South Africa and support the anti-apartheid ANC movement. Tony Benn was also a strong advocate uh, of Palestinian rights. Uh, and to uh, this end, he advocated the stopping of all arms sales to Israel. Perhaps more than anything else, Tony Benn will be remembered as a powerful voice against war and for peace. Tony was a towering figure in the anti-nuclear movement, supporting the campaign for nuclear disarmament from its very inception. And it was in February 1958, the month of CND's foundation, that Tony Benn resigned his position as one of Labour's front bench spokespeople on defence, stating that he couldn't, and these are his words, under any circumstances, support a policy which contemplated the use of atomic weapons in war. Later in his life, Tony Benn, as I mentioned earlier, became president of the Stop the War Coalition, which was formed in response to the US-led so-called War on Terror. And amongst other things, the Stop the War Coalition organized the 15th of February 2003 protest against the Iraq War in London, which saw over one million people march against the war on Iraq. Now, Tony Benn was one of the speakers that day. Then he said that day that a new political movement worldwide was being born, one that would fight not only against the war on Iraq, but one that would organise to campaign for a Palestinian state, for an end to the tens of millions dying each year of hunger, for an end for money being wasted on weapons that could go on hospitals, education and food, and on protections for the sick and the disabled, and a campaign for a world no longer dominated by the multinational corporations. All of these messages contained in Tony Benn's speech to that huge historic demonstration that day remain as relevant today as they've ever been. Even more relevant, actually, when we look at the challenges facing us. Throughout his life, Tony Benn opposed Britain becoming an unquestioning junior partner to the USA in foreign policy and advocated for Britain to adopt an independent, independent foreign policy based on playing a more constructive role in the development of international cooperation for peace, conflict resolution and human rights. And so that's why one of the three parts of our education pack, which I hope you'll use, is on Tony Benn's anti-war internationalism. I want to start this uh, session by handing over to uh, Lindsay German uh, from the Stop the War uh, Coalition uh, to give some opening remarks for this session on the anti-war internationalism of Tony Benn. Thanks very much, Richard. And I just say, firstly, what a great pleasure it is to be here. And I think just to congratulate you on a very successful event, uh, remembering, remembering Tony Benn, and not just remembering him as a person, but in terms of trying to get across some of the wider politics and the wider things that he stood for. I think this is um, incredibly important. And uh, uh, I wanted to talk, um, obviously, about his contribution to um, anti-war campaigning, peace campaigning, and, uh, as you said, anti-colonial uh, campaigning. I also want to say a couple of other things about him, which is that, um, firstly, he was extremely interested in history and in ideas, and he understood that um, these ideas were things which had to um, motivate activists and had to motivate socialists to do things that we could learn the lessons of history and hopefully not make some of the mistakes that have been made in the past and hopefully as well try to um, emulate some of the, the great struggles that we've seen um, in the past. And I think he had a great respect for these ideas and for the history itself. And um, his wife, Caroline, who was an incredibly... Um, talented political figure in her own right, uh, wrote a very good book about Keir Hardy, um, 
and I think it's it's very very well worth um, uh, reading for anybody who's who's interested in any of those kind of things. Um, and I think when you look at Tony, that sort of politics and that commitment to history, he was always at the Levellers Day in Burford every year to commemorate the um, the martyrdom of three of the um, three of the Leveller soldiers in um, in Burford Church. He loved talking about the suffragettes and campaigning around the suffragettes. He did all of those sorts of things. And I think when you look particularly at, at questions of war and imperialism, you always have to put this in the context of who he was and what he what he stood for. And of course, he, as, as John McDonnell said um, shortly uh, it, a little while ago in, in the previous session, of course, he would directly experienced war and uh, he, his generation, the same as my parents' generation, were people who served in the armed forces. He was in the uh, Air Force, um, who would lived in London and other cities during the Blitz and who knew exactly the fear of, uh, of war and the, 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 uh, the terror of war that people, people face. So I think that was a very important part of forming him. And of course, he always quoted um, the UN statement that we, the people of the United Nations, having been through war, uh, don't want any more wars again. And I think it's hard perhaps for us now to understand how strong that feeling was at the end of the war, how much people celebrated whatever the terrible costs of the war, how much people celebrated the defeat of fascism and, and the bringing of peace. And he was very much part of that generation. He lost uh, his older brother in the in the war. Um, so he again, he had direct experience, as most people did, even if they weren't affected themselves, had direct experience of loss and of, of injury and uh, displacement and so on. So I think it's important to see him in that light. And that also the other side of that was, of course, when you talk about the movement for colonial freedom, because uh, that movement was about decolonization of countries which were still in the grip of directly in the grip of the British Empire and particularly two stand out for me one is obviously South Africa and that was such an important issue for my generation but also Zimbabwe which was um, Rhodesia was a was a British colony and then declared independence and um, uh, there were big liberation movements against the white minority regime and there were the big movements in the Portuguese colonies at the time all of that was a very important backdrop to politics. And it's great credit to him that he um, he had that understanding and analysis of what uh, went on. Now, in terms of his commitment over war and peace, as again, all that generation did, they came out of a war thinking there would be peace, but the war ended with the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August uh, 1945. And therefore the threat of future wars was there just at the time when people were declaring peace in a war that had already cost the lives of 60 million people. Um, and so he was very committed to CND. He was always committed to um, CND and was, was one of the founders of it and was involved in the early movements and again in the 1980s and, uh, and more recently. And when we formed Stop the War, which we did in 2001 after the event of 9-11, he became involved in, in Stop the War as well, and he became a very, very valued supporter of Stop the War. I think that he he understood that you needed this kind of movement in, in the period of the War on Terror, in the period of um, not just absence of peace, but also of, of great imperialist aggression against, uh, against Iraq, against Afghanistan, um, against all these other countries. There's two memories that I have of him, which, uh, you know, he did so many meetings for us, spoke on so many demonstrations, and he was an absolute, um, he was a real trooper as a, as a campaigner, Tony. I mean, you know, the Palestinian, um, sorry, the, the Israeli embassy um, was, quite close to where he lived and he would turn up if there was a demonstration there with his cheese sandwich and banana and a flask of tea and later on in his life he made this little seat out of um, a kind of suitcase seat that he would sit on in demonstrations and he would turn up in terrible cold weather and very very hot weather and just sit there and wait his turn and I think Palestine was always a big issue for him um, and one of my abiding memories is the very great um, interview he did with a BBC 
uh, newsreader in 2009 when the BBC refused to um, broadcast the, um, the emergency appeal for Gaza when people were being bombed um, by the Israelis on a daily basis. Um, and he was so angry in that, um, in that uh, interview. He was very, you know, he was... He was very coherent, but he was very, very personally angry. And he said to them, you will cost the lives of people by this action. And the BBC could stop doing this straight away. And that, so that was one of the things that I remember about him um, very well. Another that I'd just like to tell people about was, funnily enough, with the Iraq war and with Afghanistan, the when Tony Blair was prime minister, we didn't get... Um, particular harassment um, of demonstrations most of the time from the police or anybody else. After Gordon Brown became prime minister, that kind of changed. And they there were a number of times where they were very heavy uh, against demonstrations uh, near Downing Street. And we wanted to have a demonstration from Trafalgar Square just down to Downing Street. And the police said it was illegal um, and they wouldn't let us do it, and they would stop us and forcefully um, prevent us from marching. He was so angry that he phoned Downing Street. He told them that he was a member of the Privy Council. He was also um, a war veteran. He said he was going to go and demonstrate from Trafalgar Square wearing his war medals, which indeed he did. He turned up in Trafalgar Square. Of course, once we assembled there and everybody got there, um, surprise, surprise, we were allowed to march down Whitehall and go to uh, go to Downing Street. But again, he put himself out personally to make a very, very strong point about um, about, you know, the right, not just the right to demonstrate, but about how right we had been about these wars and how we had the right to continue to do so. So those are, are, are two of the memories. But I have to say that right up to his near to nearly the time that he died, he was we would go around and talk to him. He would um, he would support us in all sorts of different things. He would speak uh, at meetings. We would sometimes go and have a pizza with him over in the um, the pizza restaurant that he liked so much in uh, in Notting Hill, um, where he always had the same very very plain pizza with, of course, no alcohol, no trimmings, nothing at all like that. He was um, not particularly interested in in food and and kind of good living at the same time if you went around there he always would give you a cup of tea he would always uh, and once we we took him to the restaurant the, the sort of stop the war outing and he said i'll oh, come around to my house first and he'd laid out some sort of cocktails and things which thinking that we were all going to come to the house so you know he was very very hospitable and very very polite and a very very uh nice man although i have to say he had a steel to him and he he could get very angry in, in the examples that I've um, described. And I guess you couldn't have his history without having without having some of that. But he was a man who was a fantastic campaigner for peace and against war. And I think um, we're all in his debt. I, I think to carry on his memory in this direction that you're doing, Richard, is so important because the great thing that Tony Benn can contribute to us and to, uh, to people who are socialists and activists um, today is to really look at his example. And he always said, you know, um, he said uh, that you didn't always win in these things, but it was important to campaign. He also, and he and Caroline both used to talk about the quote from William Morris, that people fight for something and then they get in, it isn't what they seem, and then you have to start to campaign for it all over again. You know, that kind of um that kind of argument. Um, he was somebody who I think by his commitment and his activity and his, his politics, which were which were very strong, was a, was an amazing influence and somebody that we can um, we can have as part of our movement and look to as part of our movement with great pride and affection. And certainly that's that's how I remember him. And I, I think carrying on that tradition is is so important for us. Thanks very much, uh, Lindsay. And it's great that we've got you here as the uh, convener of the Stop the War uh, Coalition, which obviously still exists, still is doing important work. And I'm sure that Tony would be very proud of the work uh, that it's doing now and would be part of it still if we were around uh, today. So thanks for your reflections on working with Tony Benn uh, at Stop the War Coalition uh, and on his 
uh, his wider anti-war internationalist, uh, anti-imperialist politics. Uh, we'll come back to you, Lindsay, with questions from the participants later. But now I'm going to uh, turn to uh, the former leader of our party, somebody who worked very closely uh, with Tony Benn uh, over many decades on anti-war internationalist campaigns and on many other issues uh, to talk about the importance of Tony Benn's anti-war internationalism, Jeremy Corbyn. Richard, thank you very much. And uh, Lindsay, thank you for what you just said and the way you said it. And uh, you managed to bring across the warmth and humour that uh, was always there with Tony. And um, I always felt towards the end of his life when clearly he was suffering quite a lot, he would always come to stop the war events, including steering committees and things like that, which... Um, he didn't strictly need to come to, but uh, he felt at home there. And uh, to him, it was like coming to a family gathering. And he really enjoyed um, being with a whole lot of people, particularly younger people. And he would then uh, give them advice if they sought it. But he would never um, dictate or harangue or lecture in any way. He had this... Um, endlessly optimistic view of the world which was wonderful but he also had this view that you always learnt whatever you did in life you and you kept on learning and I think that is the message of Tony you have to have an open mind and an open heart to people and the struggles that they're going through and um, I went to many places with Tony and um, uh, there's many I can remember I'll give you one example we went to uh, Belfast for the um, one of those courts that um, didn't have a jury uh, of any sort and so Tony and I turned up to observe the uh, trial that was going on down below where there was um, some people in the dock and uh, there were lawyers for both sides but the jury box was empty we went to the public gallery which was separated from the court by a glass screen but so many people had been in the court public area unable to see the court properly through the glass screen because so many people had scratched remarks on it or um, slogans and all sorts of things so you couldn't really see anything and you couldn't really hear very much either and so one of the court attendants then came up to the gallery and said to Tony and I, would we like to sit in the well of the court um, to observe what was going on? And so we said, well, that'd be very nice, but can everybody do that? And he said, no, no. So we get down into the, into the court, we're taken in there, and uh, we look around and there's no seats, at which point the court usher then directs us into the jury box. So Tony and I sat in the jury box of a juryless trial and um, the um, barristers of the defence immediately said they were delighted that at last a jury had been impanelled. It was an unusually small one, but they were very happy with its content. And so the, the jury was Tony and I in this court um, observing this trial. And then when it had finished, we were talking to the families of those people that had been uh, or still on trial when it finished for the lunch break. And Tony just pulled out his notebook and papers and started writing down everything the family said. And he then confessed that he'd, he wished he knew more about Ireland. He wished he'd known more about it all along. And he wished he'd been more involved all along. And it was, in a sense, a lovely moment. Here was a very senior politician who had been cabinet for a very long time, had been everything. And he was quite prepared to go and spend a day in Belfast with me talking to prisoners' families about the situation there. And that was Tony's learning. But I had a couple of other reflections I just want to give. Um, Tony came into Parliament in 1950 in place of Stafford Cripps. And Stafford Cripps had been um, Charles the Exchequer. He had been British ambassador to the Soviet Union during the Second World War and had been expelled and reinstated from the Labour Party and so on. I mean, there's a bit of a pattern here. And Tony then became the MP in the by-election and um, was seen as 
I guess by some people, probably is a parachuted in candidate. But he rapidly made his home and his mark in Bristol politically. And um, even now, today in Bristol, and he hasn't been the MP there since 1983, there are people who remember Tony as the MP for Bristol South East, as it then was. Um, and Tony then became more and more angry about international issues, particularly the behaviour of Britain in pursuing colonial wars. He was in Parliament right at the end of the 45 to 51 government and was then there in opposition during the intense debates with um, the Tribune Group and Keep Left and all the Tribune Brains Trust that were held all around the country during that period to try to extend socialist ideas in the party. But Tony took up the cause of the people of Kenya and the abominable abuse that they had suffered by the, at the hands of the British Army. And so Tony was in uh, Parliament speaking up along with, it must be said, Barbara Ca Castle, Leslie Hale and a number of others. And that in turn led to the um, growth of the movement for colonial freedom, now liberation, which Tony founded along with Fenner Brockway. Um, so Tony was in from the very, very beginning um, at the development of a um, anti-colonial solidarity movement in Britain. And remember, by 1954, when liberation was being founded, uh, the only British colonies that had gained their independence was India, which were then divided into Pakistan and later Bangladesh, and also, of course, Sri Lanka and then Burma, now Myanmar. None of the African colonies had gained independence. And um, the post-war Labour government, whilst nominally in favour of um, home rule for dominions, uh, as they put it, um, did not actually embrace the anti-colonial cause at all, and indeed sent troops into Malaya, into Borneo, into British Guiana, and into Kenya. And this was then increased under the Churchill government of 51 to 55. Tony was there at the very beginning with that anti-colonial struggle. And when many, many years later, after Tony had died, it was a... Um, a poignant moment being in the high court hearing the victims of um, the British military activities against the Mau people that had been chemically castrated people that had been beaten and abused and uh, the families of those that had been killed actually having their say in court and demanding not just an apology but compensation from the British government and I was thinking of Tony at all that time Tony as um Lindsay said, was a very much a founder of CND, he was opposed to nuclear weapons all his life and said quite correctly they were an abomination and would be a crime against humanity if ever used again. And he always analysed the use of them in 1945 uh, by the United States with British support in Japan and he always maintained it was completely unnecessary because Japan was on the point of collapse anyway and would have surrendered within days or weeks um, and instead those bombs were used which uh, yes it hastened the surrender of Japan but it also killed 300,000 people in one go and so Tony's um, contribution to the peace movement was massive and epic. Um, in the Labour government, 64 to 70, Tony was in the cabinet. And um, I often asked him about this. I said, you know, Vietnam and the political support that was given to the Americans over Vietnam was something that he was obviously opposed to, argued against it in cabinet. Um, and it was quite a big issue, although he and Eric Heffer always said to me, be careful how far you go with criticising Wilson on this, because Wilson kept us out of Vietnam, uh, despite enormous pressures from the United States government of Lyndon Johnson to be involved in it. And so Tony's rapid political development happened actually um, from 1970 onwards, because the 1970 election defeat was uh, unexpected. Labour was well ahead in the polls and with a day to go. Um, 
and we lost in a mixture of complacency and a <clears throat> not very exciting manifesto being put forward. Uh, this was two years after Enoch Powell had made his Rivers of Blood speech. And Tony made a speech during the election campaign saying the signs going up in Birmingham look awfully like the signs that went up over Belsen. Uh, the concentration camp in Germany, and then talked openly about the dangers of fascism arising out of the racism of Enoch Powell and um, other people. He was criticised for that speech by some people saying he'd gone too far. I was in the West Midlands at the time and we didn't think he'd gone too far at all because it was pretty clear which direction the Powell speech and Powell's antics were um, taking this country at that time. So Tony um, was very open about that then, but I think he had a very rapid political development between 70 and 74. He was um, very active in the Labour Party, pushed an awful lot of radical policies through the National Executive. He was chair of Home Policy Committee, which was a very important committee. And um, he also was very active in Chile Solidarity from 73 onwards after the coup, uh, which overthrew the AND government. And then we go back into government again in 74. And um, Tony's main concentration was on economic policy and industrial policy, um, but he also had, um, I think, a, an important influence um, on, on the government in many ways, particularly on international strategy, and was very much in favour of rapprochement and detente with the Soviet Union. Remember, we were at the height of the Cold War at that time. So Tony was always that voice and managed to get that message out quite effectively outside Parliament. Then my other memories about Tony, uh, particularly after I came into Parliament in 1983, Tony was uh, lost in Bristol, sadly, and was then elected at the Chesterfield by-election, and we were straight into the miners' strike. So we essentially spent two years working on mining issues. But he and I had some quite long discussions about the direction in which foreign policy should go. And so we founded the Campaign for Non-Alignment, and we met in Manchester, and um, a number of people who were active in CND and other organisations, particularly Walter Wolfgang, became involved in it. We produced a book about Britain outside NATO, a foreign policy without NATO. And um, I indeed spoke at various meetings and rallies, including some in Spain, on the issue of NATO membership and, non and a non-aligned foreign policy, which Tony absolutely endorsed. And we used this argument um, up to, well, I've used it all the time, but up to particularly the Gulf War and the issue of the um, occupation of Kuwait by, um, by uh, Iraqi forces, which Tony opposed. And I just remember being one of a very small number of people voting against the Gulf War in Parliament in 1991. And indeed, um, Tony was a brilliant and articulate voice on that, just as nine years before he'd been a quite lonely, but nevertheless a highly articulate voice, pointing out the Falklands War was actually more about oil than anything else, was his argument, um, and that there was um, a, a space for negotiations of future access and so on, um, being um, hosted by the Peruvian government of, of Viando Terry at that time. So uh, Tony's record on international issues and his preparedness to speak out, however unpopular it was at the time, was quite extraordinary. And then, of course, um, after he'd left Parliament, as he said famously, he was going to spend more time on politics. He then gave an enormous amount of time and support to CND to stop the war coalition and to many other international solidarity groups, uh, groups like Bahrain um, and others, he would always be there and be prepared to speak out and support. And he often phoned me up and we'd, we'd talk about issues in South Africa, we'd talk about Palestine, and we'd talk about the relationship with different countries uh, around the world. And he always said he regretted he hadn't traveled much more uh, when 
he was younger. Well, we all regret when we've never traveled more than we have, but um, Tony learned so much and was such an inspiration. But as uh, Lindsay said, fundamentally, his view of the world was formed by the principles of the UN Charter and the way in which uh, the UN was founded in 1945. And he saw that, and Lindsay's absolutely right in this, he saw that as the safety net and salvation for future generations. And um, that he said that all his life, and he carried the UN Charter around with him, as does Bruce Kent. And they would often uh, talk about this and the, the issues surrounding that. So Tony had a wonderfully internationalist view of the world, one of solidarity, one of support for people, and one of trying to understand um, how conflicts came about and that sense of history that went with it. And so he... Fenner Brockway did us a great service in the 1950s by founding Liberation, or then called Movement for Colonial Freedom, which was such an important voice at that time. And uh, now I hope will become an even more important voice in the future because we absolutely need that sense of internationalism. Were Tony here today? He would be analytical about COVID. He would be analytical about the uh, inequality of healthcare across the world. He'd be very positive about um, the electoral success of um, Evan Morales and Mass in Bolivia, when our President Arce has taken over. And he would be very optimistic that Chile will finally turn its back forever on the Pinochet years by electing a left president in a week's time, we hope. Um, so Tony would be relentlessly optimistic as he always was, but always giving space and inspiration to others. And I just think we should um, learn from his example. Had he been around, um, or rather had social media being around in the 1940s and 1950s, Imagine how much greater his reach would have been. Imagine how, how much more effective his 1981 deputy leadership campaign bid would have been. And so Tony was uh, always ahead of his time and technology, but unfortunately he wasn't really around for the uh, efficiency and joy of social media, mixed joy as it is. But I think we all owe Tony a massive debt. But above all, it was that relentless sense of optimism and determination. That's what moved me with Tony. Thanks so much, Jeremy, for that uh, useful uh, insight and also into the uh, applicability of Tony Benn's uh, internationalist analyses for the challenges that we face uh, today. Uh, I've got a few questions that have uh, uh, come in, so keep them coming in. I'm going to start by asking uh, one of these to uh, uh, Lindsay. Um, what do you think, Lindsay, that Tony Benn's vision for an independent foreign policy uh, would look like today? Well, I think he would be horrified at two developments that, that we've seen. One is the um, uh, expansion of NATO, particularly across Eastern Europe, and this is leading to possible future conflict um, with, between Russia and the EU and uh, and other NATO forces. Um, I think he'd be very alarmed by that because um, he would see that as moving in the opposite direction. And it, it's always been said that the um, when uh, Germany was reunified, it was always said that the promise that was given to Gorbachev at the time was that uh, NATO wouldn't expand eastwards. Now, it has expanded right up to the Russian border and it, it wants to expand to Ukraine and Georgia. It would be very, very serious. The other area I think that he would be very worried about is the development of hostility towards China, which, you know, that we've seen much more in the last in the last year or two. And this is partly economic, but is increasingly military. I think he'd be very, very worried about things like the AUKUS Pact, which remind me of the kind of pacts that people countries had before the First World War, where what they succeed in doing is dragging more and more people into a war if one does uh, if one does take place. So I think he'd be worried about that. And just perhaps the other thing is the use of sanctions now on such a wide scale 
that we see over Iran, over Russia, over China, over uh, Venezuela, over a whole number of different countries around the world. This is economic war, which is being waged on a whole number of countries. And it's a, it's a proxy and probably a prelude in, in some cases for war. So I think he would want to break with all those kind of ideas and say, look, the, there are real differences that have to be resolved. There are real problems in the world. Nobody um, is denying that, but you cannot do it by military escalation. I think that would be his, his fundamental point here. Thanks very much, Lindsay. I'm delighted we've been joined by Apsana Begum, uh, MP. I want to ask Apsana a question, actually. We've been talking about the... Uh, Tony Benn's role uh, in uh, the Stop the War Coalition uh, and his, uh, and his uh, opposition, uh, an articulation uh, of opposition uh, to uh, the so-called war on terror. Uh, could you kind of share with us your reflections on the importance of the campaign against so-called war on terror and the importance of the Stop the War Coalition and Tony Benn's role within that from, from your perspective? I mean, I think, well, thank you, Richard, for, for that question. It's a pleasure to be able to join you all uh, today. And I think uh, I think it's important for lots of different reasons. I mean, what we saw with the Iraq war was a mass mobilization of people campaigning and coming out on the streets uh, against the, the, the decision to go to war in our names. And I think for me, what, what really has been important in terms of Tony's contribution to, uh, to, to politics and organizing is actually the, the basis of all of our activity um, and, and our actions should be rooted in democracy. You know, and I think that's really what sums up, I think, what Tony Benn uh, really contributed to politics. It was really going back to actually what power do people have, where do they get from all those crucial questions that he, he ensured that we, we ask. But I think in terms of particularly those years with the, with the war on terror, I mean, we saw so many uh, pieces of legislation that were specifically targeting particular communities. And the war on terror legislation particularly had such a big impact on communities such as the Muslim community um, and, and the way in which we were viewed uh, um, through the lens of suspicion um, and, and the ways in which we saw our own civil liberties um, be challenged. And I think it's relevant to also think about that era, but also compared to where we are right now. And when we think about anti-war internationalism, I mean, opposing policies from governments, uh, you know, governments such as those in that, that in our country is as important as opposing similar policies and the similar ways in which other governments behave as well. And, you know, we see uh, oppression and injustices in different parts of, of the world, and we see laws being passed in different parts of the world, which are um, subjecting uh, communities to, to harm. And I think that's what's also important about um, you know, those laws that we saw, those pieces of legislation that we saw passed in our by, by um by Labour and, and Conservative governments in the last 20 years, but also the importance of um, pushing back and fighting against it, just as we, we do uh, against oppression and injustices in places such as India, in, in, in Kashmir and in, in all the other uh, places um, where we need to ensure that we extend uh, internationalist uh, solidarity. Well, thanks very much, Ipsana. Uh, I've got a question here for Jeremy, which is that we know that Tony Benn was an opponent of the war crimes exposed by Julian Assange. How do you think, Jeremy, that uh, Tony Benn would have responded to uh, the case um, for extradition against Julian Assange? You muted, sorry, Jeremy. Get so excited you speak to a blank screen, yes. Um, he would have been outside Belmarsh with Diane and you and me. He'd have been outside the High Court with us. He would have been doing what we're all doing, expressing solidarity with Julian Assange. Julian Assange is basically a whistleblower that's told the world the truth. And it's a very un inconvenient and uncomfortable truth for the powers that be in the United States and in Britain. If he were a whistleblower of the same importance based in China or Russia, he'd be hailed by the West as being a salvation because he's exposed the truth about particularly what the United States has done in various places around the world. Then um, 
he was uh, he was been denigrated and, and condemned by everybody. And as Lindsay just pointed out in the chat, he spoke at a Stop the War Coalition meeting. I'm just remembering that um, in support of, of Julian Assange. And so I'm very confident what position he would adopt on that. Interestingly, when I raised the question of Julian Assange with Boris Johnson in during Prime Minister's question time, in 2020, um, Johnson himself admitted that the extradition arrangements with the USA were, in his words, lopsided. Interesting choice of words for a prime minister to take. Um, I hoped that was going to be the start of um, a reconsideration of the extradition arrangements between Britain and the USA. Uh, but ultimately, the decision will come down to a combination of courts and the Home Secretary. We had a setback uh, with the uh, President Biden's appeal being granted, but that's not the reason to give up. That's the reason to absolutely redouble all our efforts at the moment. Julian Assange has told the world a lot of very inconvenient truths about the cost and the effect of untrammeled power around the world on the human rights of a lot of very vulnerable people. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, I don't know if Lindsay wants to add to that because she obviously was at the meetings. Just, just to say, I, mean, I agree very much with, um, with Jeremy, but we did hold this big meeting where Jen Robinson, who was one of his legal advisors was I, I can't remember who else was there were you there Jeremy probably unless you were out of the country for some reason but um mm -hmm. uh I think Tarek Ali and John Pilger and that was I mean obviously that must be getting on for 10 years ago that yeah. we we did that then so I've got absolutely no doubt he would think that I mean this is a real um travesty of of justice a real travesty of justice you're not supposed to extradite over political causes and it's clearly political and clearly the judges on Friday when they gave their uh, their statements uh, said we've been assured by the um by the American government well where's the separation of powers here this means it's a deal between the British government and the and the American government essentially what's going on there thanks uh, Lindsay and a question now for Apsana um Tony Benn was a passionate campaigner for justice for the uh, Palestinian uh, people. Um, and I know that he'd have been campaigning night and day to get a, a Labour government to do so many things in our country, but also he'd have taken great hope from the fact that if we'd have won the election in 2019, uh, Jeremy's Prime Minister, his government would have immediately recognised uh, the state uh, of Palestine. Um, can you reflect, Apsana, on Tony Benn's support for the campaign for justice for the Palestinian people, what it means to you, uh, your reflections upon that? Thanks, Richard. And I think, I mean, I think what really mattered was standing up to imperialism. And I think that's what really, uh, you know, um, challenged, I guess, uh, those years in particular when, when uh, there were demonstration after demonstrations uh, to support the Palestinian people in the UK. Um, and each time that was done and each time there was a demonstration, uh, we did see the lack of coverage. We see continue to see that to this day. And I think it's important to understand even, you know, when we look at when Jeremy was leader as well, you know, the, 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 the strong opposition to actually standing up to, to, to uh, the oppression of the Palestinian people. And, and I think it's important to uh, remember that um, it's as socialists, it's so important for us to keep at the core of our work. Um, that international solidarity that actually does challenge imperialist um, uh, powers. And, and that's what we, you know, we've already seen uh, be touched upon in terms of the case of uh, Julian Assange, which very much was about speaking truth uh, to power, which was very much about standing up to uh, the US government and, and war crimes um, done, in, done in our names. So I, I think it's, um, it's important for, for us to uh, reflect on that element in particular, that actually, um, you know, we've had um, even previous, um, previously that's in, in British politics and, and uh, across the board really, um, people who uh, claim to stand up for the Palestinian people, but actually do not want to talk about Britain's role in that, do not want to talk about 
you know, Britain's uh, role in terms of um, propping up um, other governments, other state powers, talking about, uh, you know, the amount of uh, money and, and contributions that British governments make uh, to uh, propping up governments through arms sales, for example. And unless we are talking about those things and we're talking about our own governments and our own country's role uh, um, across borders, uh, then, then we're not really talking about uh, the issues in the same way as others uh, claiming to stand up for uh, the Palestinian people. So I think that's what we've got to bear in mind when we are talking about the injustices that uh, the Palestinian people continue to face. Thank you. I mean, one thing that strikes me considering um, and reflecting upon Tony Benn's decades of political activity was the fact that whether it be a, a trade union demonstration, a demonstration against racism, a demonstration against war, a demonstration for nuclear disarmament, Tony Benn was always on those demonstrations, taking part in the mass movement. So as we today struggle against the uh, draconian police uh, crime courts and sentencing bill, it just makes me think how Tony Benn emphasised the right to protest, the importance to our political process of saying, no, this isn't OK. And so do people have any reflections? I see Jeremy raising his uh, hand. Uh, any reflections um, on the importance uh, of maintaining and defending our right to fight back against unpopular, unjust policies through protest. Jeremy. You, well, you have to do things in order to assert that right. Uh, we used to have the sessional orders passed at the beginning of every parliamentary session saying you can't have any demonstrations within a mile of Westminster while the House is in session. Um, we challenged that during the time Pinochet was under house arrest in Britain, El Piquete, the picket, um, put um, 7,000 crosses in the ground in Parliament Square and illuminated them and had a meeting there. And the police didn't do anything about it. That set the precedent for demonstrations in Parliament Square. Uh, Lindsay was talking about the right to protest when Tony sort of went up to Trafalgar Square and just said, I'm here, arrest me if you will. When we were, Lindsay and I and Chris and John and others were organising the 2003 big demonstration, two weeks before it, I got a call from Tessa Jowell, who was then culture secretary. Lindsay's smiling at this one. She phoned me up one Saturday night and said, um, um, I'm really pleased the demonstration's going so well, which may be slightly suspicious, but I'm not sure she was that pleased about it. She said, but we've arranged for it to be held in Battersea Park because you can't use um, Hyde Park because we'll, you'll damage the grass. So I said, well, I'm sure Battersea Park is absolutely fine. And if you want to go to Battersea Park on that day, that's fine. But we're going to be in Hyde Park. And if you're really concerned about the grass, then I'm sure we can find enough volunteers to reseed the whole of Hyde Park, if that's your concern. But to Hyde Park, we're going. They then said, could they think about this? They then came back and said, you can have the demonstration in Pall Mall in front of Buckingham Palace, which actually had its attractions. The idea of stop the war banners all in front of Buckingham Palace being beamed around the world was quite an attractive idea, but we still said no. We just said, well, they said, what's going to happen? We said, well, I just said, well, we're going to Hyde Park end of and then miraculously the next day the royal parks police phone up to say uh, can they talk to us about the arrangements of the rally being held in hyde park sometimes you just have to assert yourself and a million people on the streets is quite a big assertion this is going to happen over this police policing uh, demonstration thing if it goes through but it should not go through it's outrageous that we are just legally trying to limit protest anywhere else in the world this would be condemned and it should be condemned here uh, lindsay as one of the uh, people who organized the biggest demonstration in british history on the 15th of february 2003 against the uh, iraq uh, war what are your uh, reflections uh, on this well i uh, just to go back to that time People were outraged that they were trying to do this. They tried at one point to say you can have the Millennium Dome as the venue for the demonstration. And we said, look, you know, I mean, Michael Foote, who was by then very old, said that he would march on the railings of, of Hyde Park himself and would, you know, we'd tear them down, which was 
actually something that Karl Marx was involved in in the 19th century when they had um, demonstrations over the various reform bills. Um, so we had a huge movement around it and we had to go. Uh, I remember this very well. It didn't involve Tony, but we had to go. They have these little houses in Hyde Park that are kind of run where they run the operation from. And we had this very high powered meeting with all sorts of police and high park authorities and all this there. And we just said, well, we're not going anywhere else. And I've only had this happen to me a few times in my life. But they then say after about an hour of this, then say, can you give us 10 minutes? And they go off somewhere and obviously phone somebody. And then they come back and say, OK, you can have it. And the same happened when George Bush came. So I think the key thing is, as Jeremy said, keep protesting is the way that you defend protest. But we've also got to say what this government is doing is trying to stop protests of any sort. And it is a very dangerous thing. It's a denial of our liberties. And we just have to say we're not going to take it. So obviously, people like yourselves are going to do what you can in Parliament. And hopefully, you know, you'll get a few things altered from it. But the crucial thing is, we have to oppose it before it happens. But then once it's happened, we have to say we are not accepting this. And the truth is, when you don't accept it half the time, actually, this reminds me of something that Tony Bent used to say very famously. He said the strongest word in the English language is no, because if you say no, then your opponents have to go away and think what they're going to do about it. And it's absolutely right. So we'll definitely be saying no to any restrictions on our protest. Wonderful. I've got a final question for a quick answer from all three of you, Apsana, uh, Lindsay, and then uh, Jeremy. It's a really interesting question. Um, has it only been economics that has prevented the Labour Party in the past from pursuing a peaceful foreign policy? Or are there other factors involved uh, as well? Uh, Apsana? I think, um, you know, it, no, is, is the straight answer to that. But I think it's important to uh, remember um, what Tony had said actually when um, when he uh, when when there were many people blaming uh, Labour's uh, lack of electoral success in the eighties, um, you know, and and he you know Tony Benn was sort of a, a, a totem for those who re rejected shifts uh, to the right, um, and obviously those you know the reforms that came after, and we're talking I'm talking specifically about the Labour Party. Here, uh, which were eventually continued um, and completed by by Tony Blair and 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 Tony himself said we're not we're not here just to manage capitalism but to change society and def to define its finer values. I think he couldn't have put it more um, more succinctly than that for the rest of us who have since come through um, and are trying to uh, challenge um, all the different various forms of capitalism, um, not just in terms of the economic sphere, but, but in other spheres as well. So um, that's, I think, uh, something for us all to think about. Uh, Lindsay, was it, is it, was it just about economics or were there other considerations as well? I think that, and Tony represents kind, kind of this in a way, there are two sort of strands within Labour. Well, Tony and Jeremy very much represent one strand of it, which is opposition to war, opposition to empire and to colonialism and all this sort of thing. We know as well there is another strand within Labour, and we've seen it, unfortunately, too frequently, um, which, is, which is very committed to British imperialism, which is very committed to the so-called nuclear deterrent, which is very committed to arms spending. And uh, if you look at, at the Attlee government, although the Attlee government did, you know, lots of very, very good things, particularly domestically, its foreign policy was less, you know, was much more conservative and um, much more supportive of empire than um, than uh, you might expect looking at its domestic policy. So I think there is this real division there. And I think we've got to accentuate the people who are opposing this kind of thing. And I think, you know, it goes through quite, it, it's quite a divide within Labour, as I'm sure I don't need to explain to anybody here, and you know, Jeremy in particular, who's witnessed and experienced a, a lot of this, that, uh, uh, and I think with Keir Starmer, unfortunately, you're going to, you're going to get more of this, the fact that, um, you know, they, they support interventions in wars, the fact that we, uh, people referred earlier to the, John McDonnell, I think, to the Hillary Benn speech, which is a shocking speech, really, at every kind of level. Um, I, th I think this tells you there are these two sides. So it's about more than economics. It isn't just economics. It's a political uh, issue as well. And it's one that we have to deal with. And 
you know, people always say stick to domestic policies because foreign policies are more controversial. But, you know, foreign policy is domestic policy in this country. We, we're the inheritors of the biggest empire in the world. And we have to take some responsibility for that and have some honesty about that as well. I think that's uh, correct. And the importance, as you say, there are two strands within uh, the Labour Party when it comes to uh, foreign policy uh, and international considerations. And that's why social movements, uh, of which Tony Benn was such a part, are so important because they help to make the case even when there's a Labour government, for the policy to be one based upon peace and conflict resolution and human rights, while rather than supporting uh, any war that the United States uh, proposes. Uh, Jeremy, you'll know uh, what how these things are characterised. Um, people who support war and bombings, they're the moderates in Parliament, and the people who oppose wars, the untrustworthy extremists, so would you like to reflect upon that? Well, in two days, I was condemned by the Daily Telegraph as putting Britain at risk because I was not prepared to use nuclear weapons. And the following day, I was condemned for putting Britain at risk because I would have my hands on a nuclear button. It can't be both. And uh, it's the uh, this strange idea that somehow you're a moderate if you want to expand military activities and go to war around the world and export arms to dodgy regimes. And uh, you're an extremist if you oppose war and want to bring about peace, justice, democracy and human rights, because, of course, that threatens the economic power of people to exploit companies to exploit oil and other natural resources. So, yes, there is an economic link. This is a very interesting question there isn't time to give it the the answer it really deserves can i just give you two minutes if i may richard can you indulge me for two minutes happy to indulge you for more than two minutes jeremy well i'm worried about your time um (laughs) if you look above my head you'll see you'll see a mug with a face on it of a bearded man the previous bearded leader of the labor party was keir hardy he was a genuine internationalist who in 1907 went on a world tour to the United States, to South Africa, to India, and um, and other colonies as they were then as well, and had a genuine internationalism about him. And the socialist movement across Europe was convulsed in a debate about the need for workers' unity in the face of the then obvious rush towards rearmament and a European war, essentially between Germany and um, Britain and France. And um, that international movement was very strong, very strong indeed. And then it, uh, in 1914, when the war broke out, um, Keir Hardy opposed the war from the front bench in Parliament, having spoken the previous day in Trafalgar Square against it. And he was heckled by Labour MPs behind him who sang the national anthem to try and drown him out. And that was the fault line in the Labour Party at that time over the First World War. And whilst Keir Hardy continued to oppose the war, and indeed toured the country opposing the war, he died a year later um, of a heart attack, I think it was, but it was a heart attack. But uh, he was essentially destroyed and defeated by the way in which the Labour movement had become proponents of uh, recruitment and sending people to their deaths in the First World War. So there was that very fundamental difference. And in the 1920s, there was again a huge debate about um, empire preference and inclusion of colonies or independence for colonies. And there was a quite strong paternal movement in the Labour Party of um, saying that uh, we should um, promote um, sealed trade arrangements between Britain and the colonies and we should keep the colonies more or less as they are and eventually allow self-government to develop. Uh, Incredibly patronising nonsense. Um, But it was a very powerful voice within the party. Then we move on to the run up to the Second World War. George Lansbury, pacifist, totally genuine internationalist, was drummed out of the leadership of the Labour Party by very strong voices led by Ernie Bevin. Fast forward, end of the Second World War, Ernie Bevan becomes Foreign Secretary and pursues the Cold War with a vengeance, which even the um, even the Tories were surprised by. And uh, 
pushed, not just helped, but pushed for the foundation of NATO. And the Labour government, as Lindsay quite correctly said, did amazing things in the UK. It really did. National Health Service, Council Housing, Town and Country Planning Act, so many things, amazing things. Internationally, whilst Indian, India did gain its independence uh, through partition and Pakistan was formed, then later that split into becoming Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, it uh, pursued a foreign policy, which was one of continuing colonial wars, as I said earlier. And Attlee, in secret, managed to spend £200 million then on developing secretly Britain's own nuclear deterrent, which even Churchill didn't know about. He was leader of the opposition. He only found out about it when he became prime minister. The cabinet were never told. Nobody was told. It was done totally in secret. I don't think secrecy would hold in the current climate at all to that extent, but it did then. And so that debate in the Labour Party has never gone away. Hence the big debate over CND in the 1950s, big debate over Vietnam, big debate over foreign policy and uh, the disaster of Iraq. The disaster of the Iraq war, the bombing of Syria and of Libya and all the other wars that it's created and the terrorism it's created isn't going to go away. I gave an apology on behalf of the party in 2016 um, for the Iraq war. And that was the day I was put under the most pressure and abuse by everybody. Not, not yourself, obviously, Richard or Epsana, but people in the party, you remember it very well, not to make that apology and not to do it. I would promised to do it. And I did it. And I think that was a, the right thing to do because it helped to set the agenda differently about how we will deal with international relations in the future. So how are we going to react now to the situation in Ukraine and Russia? Are we going to just join in with the dangers that entails? Or are we going to say, let's talk to Russia, be critical where appropriate, but above all, talk to Russia, try and bring about dialogue rather than spending hundreds of millions on troop deployments that can only lead to some disastrous conflict in the future. Peace has got to be the option we pursue. I think that those are comments that uh, I can imagine uh, Tony Benn himself uh, making. So thanks for that, Jeremy. And just one quick reflection. You mentioned the mug above your head with uh, Keir Hardy on it and the experiences he had. Uh, I've got a punch cartoon friend in my house uh, that shows Keir Hardy whilst on his speaking tour in India uh, being grabbed by the scruff of the neck by um, Britannia personified. Uh, Keir Hardy's holding a torch that says socialism on it and the smoke coming out of it says sedition. And the cartoon is entitled The Mischief Monger. And it says that Britannia is saying to Keir Hardy, here, you'd better come home. We know all about you there and you'll do less harm. So uh, that makes me reflect upon how Keir Hardy was treated in relation to international policy, how you were treated in relation to international policy, uh, and how Tony Benn was relate, uh, treated in relation to international policy. I want to thank uh, Lindsay, Jeremy and Apsana for taking part in this session. I want to thank all of you for logging in today, the people watching on Zoom, the people watching on YouTube, uh, on Twitter, uh, and on Facebook. And I hope that this has been uh, a useful launch uh, of uh, the Tony Benn Lessons for the Present Crisis uh, Education Pack. I'm pleased I've been able to uh, put it together. And thanks to all those who've supported me uh, in doing that. Um, the teaching pack, just to emphasize, um, today we haven't delivered the teaching pack. This has been a discussion to launch it, but the teaching pack is there, it's out there for you to use, it includes a workshop presentation, it includes speaker notes, videos, and suggested further reading. Links have been posted in the chat so you can download it. I'm going to ensure it's sent to everyone registered today. And as I said at the beginning of this session, I'm going to be circulating it amongst tens of thousands of Labour members, trade unionists, and social justice campaigners. It's about empowering you to deliver political education and facilitate political discussion in your area, in your Labour Party branch, in your trade union branch, in your Stop the War branch, in your uh, community events. I think it's been three fantastic sessions today uh, with Rachel uh, Garnham, 
um, on democracy and Tony Benn's wider influence with John McDonnell uh, and Jess Barnard on Tony Benn's alternative economic uh, strategy. And of course, with Jeremy Apsana and Lindsay on Tony Benn's anti-war internationalism. If people can uh, donate a, a small amount, uh, if they're able to do so during these tough times, that would be great. The links uh, are there and that will enable us to roll out our next education package, which we hope to be on Sylvia Pankhurst, a great fighter for women's rights, socialism, trade unionism, and against fascism. And just to be clear, our aim is to mark International Women's Day with rolling out an education uh, pack uh, in relation to uh, Sylvia Pankhurst. So thanks to all of you. Political education is so important because it empowers us to not only learn the lessons of history, but to analyze the challenges we face today and the arguments and analyses of Tony Benn in relation to democracy, the economy, anti-war internationalism, are sadly more important than ever when we look at the huge dangers and the huge challenges our world and our society face. So thanks to everyone for taking part and being here. Please go out and organize these workshops in your area. It's in your hands now. It's for you to do. It's about empowering you. So let's get to it.